Yup. You read that video title correctly. If you've ever wondered what hours upon hours of Survivor players using creative strategies to win challenges looked like, well, have I got a video for you. Internet, my name is Pritium, and if you're new to my channel, or you're not, your eyes do not deceive you, this is a massive compilation of over 50 challenge hacks across 10 videos edited together into one. For the past two years, I have analyzed the tapes, dissected the strategies, and it's all culminated right here. I've added timestamps to separate each segment, but otherwise, if you've already watched all of the previous 10 parts, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Up for a rewatch? Without further ado, here are over 50 times Survivor Players Hack Challenges. I'll see you on the other side. Let's talk about the first one. It is Steven Fishback in Survivor Token Sheens when he won a challenge called Propeller Heads involving an obstacle course to solve a simple math algorithm. For this challenge, you had to run through the course, memorize the pattern, and then head back the way you came and input the numbers, relying on memory and basic math. The four symbols were on a rotating pole, and thus it could become confusing to remember the exact sequence on your first go. JT took a quick lead and lapped Steven. He went up and back twice before Steven even got to the end of the course once. But Steven only needed one go. Despite taking forever in the sand dig, falling off of the balance beam like 10 times, and being just physically drained, at least it looked that way, he made his way back to the table to do the math, and unlike the rest of his tribe mates, he put all 10 symbols on his table on his first time back. He then applied simple math, and he beat JT by just a few seconds, despite JT having a massive, massive lead. So what happened? Well, Jeff Probst asked Steven the same question. How did you remember every number in one go when every other person had to take at least two trips? Basically, Steven assigned a number to each symbol, one for plus, two for minus, three for multiply, and four for divide, and then created a sequence of two numbers. The first five symbols were one number, and the second five were another. Kind of like memorizing your phone number, the human brain only holds so many digits before it starts to taper off. By simplifying the memorization, Steven was able to avoid needing to run back and forth again and again and again. And despite falling way behind initially, proved it only took one clever little trick to win his first immunity. Steven back with his first set of symbols. He's out there a long time. How many can his brain hold? With only one look at the symbol, Steven's doing all of this on one pass. Steven is right! Steven wins immunity! Oh my god, I don't want immunity! I can't even believe it! Let's talk about Amanda Kimmel. Very underrated player, I think, who doesn't get enough credit for her challenge prowess. Remember, she played in back-to-back -back seasons with China and Micronesia, and both times reached that final tribal council both times winning the final immunity challenge of the season. And that's why she's coming up twice on this list, with two clever maneuvers in both of those challenges that clinched her a spot at the final tribal council. For Survivor China, she competed in the final challenge called Broken China, which involved the players balancing porcelain dishes on a wobbly balancing beam. Every so often, Jeff would tell them to add another type of dish to their stack, making it increasingly more difficult to balance the stack. And I don't know about you guys, but when it comes to balancing stuff, Usually people tend to put things upright. After all, I don't put my dishes upside down on surfaces, pretty much for any reason. So when approaching this challenge, initially Amanda and everyone else were balancing the various dishes right side up, which eventually caused the elimination of two of the players. It came down to Amanda versus Denise, and while both of them had balanced the same types of dishes in the exact same way, Amanda took the next dish and pulled a fast one and flipped her dish upside down. She then repeated this process again, giving her structure a little bit more stability in the home stretch. She knew the structures weren't long to last and were identical between the two of them up to this point, so by flipping the bowl, she changed direction. Denise's upright bowls proved not stable enough and down they went. Amanda makes a strategic move and goes the other direction. All right, Amanda, what do you think? What do you mean? Make a deal? You don't want to give up easily, do you? Denise loses concentration. 
Amanda wins the final immunity challenge. Likewise, in the final challenge of Micronesia the next season, Amanda competed against Parvati and Sari in a challenge called the Ball Drop. This challenge required players to balance a small metal ball on a wooden beam divided into sections with two paddles on either side holding those sections up. Over time, they would add more sections of the beam to make it increasingly longer and more difficult to balance. The challenge took place over five rounds, with each round proving tougher than the last, and while very minor, there is one small change, like Amanda's previous win, that she pulled off that assisted in her winning this challenge. When gripping the beam with the paddles, players always held the handles with the bottom of their wrists facing downward, and initially this didn't make a difference. But in round three and four, she switched up her method. She held the beams underhanded with her wrists facing upward this time, giving a rest to parts of her wrists, changing where the pressure was being applied. This allowed her to relax her grip when overhanded so that when she made it to the final round, round five, she switched back to an overhanded grip and had more strength with those muscles, enough to outlast Sari and win the challenge. Sari, on the other hand, maintained an overhanded grip the entire time, and because this final round would not have a rest and would come down to endurance, meaning they couldn't adjust their grip at any point, Eventually, Sri's overhand grip gave out sooner. It's a small detail, but it goes a long way. This could be the round that decides it all. Here we go. Amanda going underhand this time. Sri sticking with the same grip. Wherever you're holding it, do not move it. Sri loses her concentration. Amanda wins final immunity and is guaranteed a spot at the final tribal council. You know what? Let's stick around in Micronesia and talk about Parvati and James. In a tribal challenge in the pre-merge called United We Stand, you probably will remember this one, James the Gravedigger hacks a challenge rather impressively and wins it pretty much all on his own. The task at hand involved each tribe ferrying two of their players across small beams with lily pad-esque platforms on top, enough to fit maybe both of your feet. Each tribe was given two of these beams and they were intended to be used as stepping stones to give the players on top of them a path from one structure to the next. This challenge was first held three seasons prior and Parvati lost it and this time she was not letting history repeat itself. Because James was such a big guy, a strong guy with some massive muscles on him, instead of alternating the two lily pad beams to create a path, here is the hack. James just picked up the beams carrying one of his tribe mates and literally walked them across the water. Jeff was stunned and impressed and hey, wasn't breaking the rules. Even when Parvati fell off of the lily pad into the water and James's tribe had to go back to transport her again, it didn't really make a difference. This small maneuver, this slight change in strategy, easily gave them the win and broke the challenge, so much so that the next time we saw it 10 seasons later, they didn't even use poles. And then they did go back to poles and co wrong, and I think they just kind of made a house rule where you, you can't do what James did. That's, that's not allowed. That's hacking. Too much hacking. Too big brain or big muscle. Wow, I Rai trying to outthink the challenge, not using two poles. Oh, that's the way to go. James carrying the pole, the rest of the tribe keeping it steady. It works, it is a great strategy. Malakal now using I Rai strategy. Are they too late? Okay, Mike, up. Uh, one, two, three. Ah! The fourth hat comes in the way of another tribal challenge. Taking place in a more recent season than the previous ones, we have the Yawa tribe from heroes versus healers versus hustlers, who, in the pre merge portion of the game, came from way behind to not only win a challenge, but absolutely obliterate it. Again, it wasn't even close, all because of one little hack. The challenge was called Disky Business, and it involved every tribe member pulling on a rope connected to a disc in the center. One by one, each player had to place a block on the disc to spell out the word immunity. The trouble was that this required a lot of coordination between every person because if one person had too much slack on the rope, the disc would angle itself and the blocks on top would collapse, which we saw happen a lot. Initially, the Yawa tribe was in the lead, taking it slow and steady and getting their blocks placed nice and neat. They even at one point had the word spelled out entirely until it fell. Meanwhile, the other two tribes were at least halfway toward victory, and this is where things get interesting. The Yawa tribe was so far behind, they began to hastily speed up their movement to catch up. In their endeavor, it seems they cracked the code to winning this challenge easily. 
And I'm not sure who should get credit for this one of the tribe. It might just be like a tribe-wide fair share, but Jessica is the first to speak on it. The strategy for Yawa went from being slow and steady like everyone else to fast and tense. Each of the other three tribe members pulled hard on their rope to create no slack whatsoever. The disc became so stable in the middle that balance was barely a concern. This allowed each member to fast walk back and forth placing their blocks almost with reckless abandon to where they caught up and then won the challenge coming in first. At one point, each of the three tribes were on their last letter at the same time, but it didn't matter. Yawa was cakewalking through this. Lesson to be learned. Slow and steady doesn't always win the race. We got the tension, Mike. You just walk. Mike, we got the rope. Let go. Yawa with a completely new strategy. Yawa's already halfway there. Mike with their fifth. Hold it. Yawa's strategy may be paying off. Just walk it back, Mike. Just Jessica like places the seventh letter for Yawa. We win, Jess. We, we win. We got it. Yawa wins immunity. Yeah. Yeah. We're looking for second. For the final hack of today, I'm gonna be straightforward. We got Yul Kwan no scoping a cannonball through the bottom of a rowboat, taking it home for his tribe on Survivor Cook Islands. I love this hack, this clever little workaround. It's so simple, yet so effective. This challenge is called Depth Charge, and it involves the players paddling rowboats above a shallow surface where they must align a glass bottom sniper scope crosshair of sorts with a mechanism underwater. When the crosshairs are lined up with the mechanism, they drop a cannonball through a hatch to release a set of buoys. And eventually they would use these buoys to form a word, of course, a puzzle, which wins them the challenge. Initially, the opposing tribe, the Raro tribe, not Yule's tribe, had pulled ahead. They managed to successfully line up their crosshairs, doing it the usual way the challenge was intended, and drop cannonballs, triggering the buoys free. Given this was the trickiest part of the challenge by far, had Raro managed to get their third one, they likely would win. But aligning the crosshairs was proving tricky. The boat had to be completely parallel between the underwater mechanism where you had to drop your cannonball and the crosshairs had to be perfectly aligned, otherwise you would miss. Yule's tribe missed continuously, falling way behind, until Yule decided to get clever. He realized the crosshairs were only there to assist them, but they weren't required to be used. Instead, Yule did what was easier for him. He looked over the side of the boat and aligned the cannonball shoot with the mechanism and then just pulled the trigger. This proved to be a lot easier and way more effective. His tribe went on to get two more buoys this way, catching up to the opposite tribe. And then for the third set of buoys, he didn't even look over the edge of the boat. He just opened up the cannonball hatch and used that as his crosshairs because it was literally right where he needed to drop it. And he did. And it worked. At one point, Yule was so excited from discovering his hack, he began to tell his tribe his new strategy and they all had to shush him, shh, so the other tribe wouldn't hear him. And I don't think they did. I can spot the thing through the... <laughs> We're gonna lose all our... Rero just wasted a cannonball. They weren't paying attention. Dropped oh, it right please, through the ship. Yeah. What's that? I said, oh, please. Jonathan getting frustrated by me. We're talking about Vesepia Towery from season four, Survivor Marquesas. Now this is old school Survivor, which means we're getting something unique and out of left field. And in this case, it's the final four immunity challenge known as Fallen Comrades, where the remaining players meet with Jeff at tribal council and compete in a trivia competition where the questions are all about the rest of the cast. What's their significant other's name? How many siblings do they have? Who was the 1997 National Water watermelon seed spitting champion. Who was the 1997 national watermelon seed spitting champion? You know, basic facts about who they are as a person. Vesepia goes on to get every question right, except for a bonus point in the first question, and is the only player to do so as well. And her simple trick was ingenious. And I gotta believe it's why we've probably never seen this competition held again, except for like a slight variation 25 seasons later. The hack that Vesepia uses is that every player on a season of Survivor gets to bring a luxury item with them on the show. Sometimes people bring their state flag or a banner. One guy brought a magic eight ball, but Vesepia brought a poetry journal. And throughout this season, Vesepia used this little journal to take notes on the rest of the cast in the event any of this information might become useful down the line. And of course it did. Knowing Fallen Comrades was a recurring challenge. It had happened in the first three seasons and this was season four, V studied her cast and aced every personal question asked in this trivia challenge when her neck was on the line, and had she not won, she would have been voted out. I'm not gonna sit there and try to compare notes with those guys. This immunity is too important for me. 
I know where Patricia's from, but that's why I said I think it starts with an L. I know exactly where she's from. One of the goals that I had while I was here was to develop a relationship with everyone and know as much as I can about them. I'm gonna go in there, I'm gonna play the best community game that I can. If I don't win it, I know I'm out of here. In which branch of the armed services did John train to be a nurse? Pascal, we'll go to you first. Kathy, Nalia, Army is not right. D, if you get this right, you have 10 and you win. Show me your answer. Air Force is correct. V wins immunity. The next hack is one of the more well-known instances of a player going above and beyond to win a challenge, and all I gotta say for anyone to understand what I'm talking about is one word. Dolphin Boy. Actually, that was two words. Regardless, this challenge in Season 16, Micronesia, involved the cast funneling coconuts through a 30-foot elongated cage all while underwater at yeah, Survivor. Things get complicated. It was a tiring task of constantly diving down, pushing a coconut, ascending for air, and so on and so forth. Only one player per tribe could go at a time, and they could never go back to back. And because there were four divers per tribe, one player would need to go at least three times. Ozzy quickly realized this was a challenge, of course, all about speed underwater, and he is pretty much the undisputed goat of underwater challenges, so what does he do? Ozzy dives first, and instead of pushing one coconut the length of the cage, he pushes four coconuts at the same time. He then pushes one coconut to the surface, leaving the other three at the very end of the cage. One by one, the next three players on his team jump in, grab their coconut in one dive, and return to the platform. It's a quick process that at first seems to set Ozzy's tribe back. He took a little bit longer than the other tribe to get four down the cage at once, but once you realize that Ozzy's speed in the water was unparalleled, his tribe didn't have to worry about any of them being slow in the water because they barely had to go in the water in the first place. This was Ozzy's bread and butter, and his tribe easily won the challenge once they collected every coconut, all thanks to this little strategy, this little tiny tactical maneuver, and then James triumphantly spelled the word scramble correctly. Ozzy's spending a lot of time underwater. He's still working at the end of the cage. Henner swims out to the front of the cage where Ozzy has pushed a coconut forward. with the ninth coconut. One coconut left for the favorites. Triumphant, would that be good? Yeah. If I come up with the damn puzzle, come on. Mikey B up with the ninth coconut for the fans. Yeah. Triumphant. Favorites win reward! Actually, I lied to you guys. Just like in part one, in which I included six examples instead of five, we're gonna do that here too. My number 2.5 challenge hack is in episode three of season 25, Survivor Philippines, and it's no less a hack, even though it's very similar to what I just talked about. We saw another fantastic challenge strategy play out that was quite like Ozzy's, and it was amusingly performed by a player who was on Ozzy's tribe during that coconut water challenge, Jonathan Penner. In this land-based challenge, one at a time, each tribe would send a player through an obstacle course to secure a bag of balls. Always gotta be balls. Can't have a challenge video without balls. At one point in the course, the players would need to dig up these bags of balls in a pit of mud. The bags were deep and difficult to find, and they could leave a player befuddled if they got unlucky. So Jonathan implemented a strategy like Ozzy. He went first for his tribe, and when he got to the pit, he spent extra time digging up all four bags and placing them in one location. While this initially set his tribe back in the first heat, every subsequent player on his team didn't have to waste time digging around, potentially covering the ground of their previous teammate, and could instead just grab the bag and move on. This tactic gave Jonathan's tribe a huge, huge advantage by the end of the challenge, like what we saw with Ozzy in the water. Penner still searching. Penner has a bag of balls. Penner is looking for all the bags for his team and pulling them up. Got them all, they're in the corner. New strategy by the red team. That could be a big difference in this challenge. Corner. That corner, right from you. Penner's already grabbed the balls and put them up there. Easy for Carter. There. Denise quickly finds her bag. Malcolm out on the court, in the water, all he's got to do is pick up that last bag. And just like that, Malcolm has his fourth bag, he's through the rice. This could do it! Yeah. There it is, Malcolm! Quick reward for the red team! 
The fourth hack is another well-known but equally out of left field strategy that also breaks another challenge and to this day, we have yet to see it return. And for you super fans out there, you probably know what I'm talking about. I am talking about the Survivor Auction, a reward challenge that used to be a staple on the show, but ever since season 30, the last time we saw it, Survivor Worlds Apart, it was retired, all thanks to this one moment. Super fans, they always think they know it all. <clears throat> and in some cases they do, because in episode nine, the Merge Tribe heads to the auction and a few of the players really want and expect an advantage to pop up. Several players hold their money. That is, until Jeff whips out letters written by their loved ones. He puts the letters up for auction. Whoever the highest bidder is wins a reward that should fill their heart. Just like the advantage, several of the players really want this. They want that loved one's letter. And that's kind of the point of this challenge. It's a social-based competition that intends to breed conflict. That's the selling point for the producers, and that's why they include it. But what if there was a strategy that could eliminate that conflict in one swift blow. Shireen immediately pipes up and tells everyone the strategy. One person should bid the lowest amount, $20, and based on past trends of previous auctions in previous seasons, Jeff will then let anyone else buy their letter for the same amount. She encourages the players to not be greedy, to trust her instinct, everyone can win in the end and beat the producers at their own game. And that's exactly what happens. Sierra bids for $20, wins her letter, and then like clockwork, Jeff smirks, says his lines, and everyone else buys their letter for the same low price. What a steal. Well, almost. You guys, in, in the past, whatever the highest bid ended up being, Jeff let everybody else buy it for that high bid. 20. Sierra, gonna bid for 20? Anybody else who wants to buy their loved one letters from home for $20 can do so. Everyone's in for 20? Let's go. It's fair. Let's go. Let's go. get it, you guys. Yeah. Mike, did you get? He didn't do it. Wow. Mike didn't do it? He didn't do it. I knew you All weren't right. gonna do it. Well, then I'll give mine back. That's bull. I'll give it back. This next fifth hack is pretty cool and just leaves me impressed with the execution. In episode four of season 14, Survivor Fiji, a tribal challenge occurs where each tribe must stand on a beam side by side over the water. One by one, the players almost sidle from one platform to the other, but the difficulty is that the player furthest from the target destination has to go first. The other players all must stay where they are. Players aren't allowed to touch the beam with their hands, nor can they touch more than one other player at a time. The tricky part of this challenge is rather evident. The beam is just not very wide. Players bump up against each other and knock each other off and then have to reform and restart. A player could get far along and then mess up on the last person and must go all the way back. Balance is key and that's where the successful strategy comes into play. After falling behind and several failed attempts, the Moto Tribe concocts a strategy whereby every player on the beam crouches down and squats. Meanwhile, the player crossing simply leaps over each player using the squatting tribe for support. By lowering their center of gravity, the tribe becomes a lot more stable and doesn't have to rely on holding each other or knocking one another off when the passing player gets to them. This strategy proves to be incredibly effective as Moto comes from behind where they were losing initially 0-2 to two, to win the challenge 7-2. to two. The other tribe couldn't believe it. Let's chop squat, let's chop squat. Dreams has a new idea. Your hands cannot touch the beam. Use your hands and put your weight on him, but make sure it's balanced. Lisi, one member left to get over. Lisi across for Moto. Moto's strategy is starting to work. Alex over Boo. Moto is tied at two, two. Dreams is across. It is five, two. Boo gives a wave to the crowd. Moto wins reward. Finally, I just gotta make mention of this hilarious strategy, this last hack, or whatever you wanna call it, that takes place in episode five of Survivor Season 8, all Stars. The three tribes are given large piles of tied up bamboo and tasked with building a raft capable of carrying each of their four members in a relay race to see who is the fastest. One tribe attempts to build some kind of 
Ah, oh, geez, cataract. Another builds like a pontoon. I don't know. They get creative and want to show the world they are survivalists. They deserve to be on the first ever All Stars season. Meanwhile, the third tribe, the Green Tribe, Mogo Mogo, employs a strategy that, well, let's just say if you've ever been in a group project, decided doing the bare minimum was good enough, and just kind of hope for the best, you may have been onto something. Mogo Mogo looks at their stacks of bamboo, says, you know what? All these things already float as is. I reckon we can just tie them together, creating a massive pile of bamboo, and just float on that. Work smarter, not harder. The genius here is that this created a makeshift canoe, and in a challenge all about speed, this raft was proving itself to be quite speedy. Because it wasn't very wide, it didn't face as much resistance, and so when Mogo Mogo took it to the course, they won the challenge quite handily. And yes, of course, Jeff had to call them out for how ugly it was. What a bunch of hacks. The challenge was to construct a raft that was worthy of the sea. So that meant this raft not only had to carry Lex and Kathy and I and a normal human being, but it's got to carry 260 pounds of hatch. These bundles, as they are, will never sink. Don't think too hard. Simple is always better. Ultimately, it came down to laziness and pure exhaustion that designed that raft. Mogo Mogo out to a slight lead. Mogo's raft looks nice, but it's slow. Mogo Mogo pulling away with the worst looking raft of the three. Mogo Mogo still with the big lead. Mogo Mogo increases their lead. Mogo by far with the best looking raft and the least effective. Mogo Mogo celebrating for the even finish. We now find ourselves in episode 2 of season 8 Survivor All-Stars, and yeah, there are a lot of unique strategies on this season. In the episode 2 immunity challenge, the tribes are tasked with raising a boat that's held underwater by a bunch of heavy crates. They need to go beneath the surface, untie some knots, and then take the crates out of the boat, and then once the boat reaches the surface, they use buckets on a platform to bail the water out until they can fit their tribe into the boat to paddle back to shore. Like many challenges, it's all about speed, and the creative strategy strategy here is a quick one. It's a blink and you might miss it, but it makes a world of a difference. Once the Red Shapara tribe raises their boat to the surface, they drag it to the provided platform and ignore their buckets altogether. Wait, hold on. So if they're ignoring their buckets, how do they get the water out? Simple. Weight distribution. Amber sits on top of the boat and tips it upward so Rob can drag it onto the dock. The tribe then flips the boat over and voila, all the water's out. Gravity. Who to thunk? Likewise, Shapara then also keeps the momentum by equally distributing the weight in their boat by placing Big Tom, the biggest guy in their tribe, in the middle. Contrast this with Mogo Mogo's boat that has its weight distribution all out of whack and then proceeds to slowly sink. Bless their hearts. So yeah, the hack here was ignoring what the producers wanted them to do and instead finessing the challenge in their own way. A recurring motto in this video series, think smarter, not harder. Here I'm starting to flip their boat. Mogo Mogo almost back to the platform. Shapira flipping their boat. Shapira's boat is empty. Shapira takes the lead. Mogo Mogo trying to bail water. Mogo Mogo paddling while they bail. A risky strategy. Mogo Mogo sinking deeper. In fact, let's keep digging deeper into history. This strategy was first used in Boston Rob's original season, season four, Marquesas, when his opposition, the Rotu tribe, did the exact same thing. We saw Gabe be the first player to think of this idea of flipping the boat over, and both tribes who pulled this little strategy off went on to win the challenge. Kind of like how in the previous video, Challenge Hacks Part 2, we went on to see Malcolm utilize the same strategy in season 26 that Penner used in season 25. Malcolm was on Penner's team in season 25 for that challenge and attempted a similar technique a season later, but the only problem here for Malcolm was that the other team also then copied him and just did it faster. This next hack is one of my favorites, if only because in all of the hacks that I've talked about, this is going to be one of the most bizarre. It's an instance of an entire cast 
hacking a competition where they completely ignored what the producers intended and instead ran the challenge their own way. You probably wouldn't even notice that what they did was unintended as it appears so intentional, it's difficult to imagine that the producers expected anything else. In the premiere episode of season 21, Survivor Nicaragua, the first challenge of the season had both tribes stacked on a large set of steps, with the intent to pour water down some gutters and into a bucket at the bottom. Once the bucket was full of water, it would then release some puzzle pieces and then the second part of the challenge would commence. In the episode, the moment Jeff said go, we saw both tribes immediately assemble a giant slide straight from the top to the bottom. Water was then poured down the long gutter and into the bucket. <laughs> was this even a challenge? Apparently it was. This water pouring part of the challenge was so quick and so simple, I was surprised it even needed to exist. It was almost like the producers didn't have anything else to do with like half their tribe, so they just said stand there and uh, lead the water down. Originally, this challenge was going to force the players to create a zigzag-like pattern from top to bottom, which would make the water flow more uneven and difficult, requiring balance and craftier teamwork. If you pause the video at the challenge, you can see that the players are all tethered on opposite sides of the platforms, which tells me they were intended to stay in place and not position themselves wherever they wanted. But because there was enough slack on their tethers, they all just leaned forward and created what we saw play out. So that's why this is one of the most bizarre challenge hacks. The entire cast pulled it off and made it look like it was no challenge at all. Jeff even went on to say in a post episode interview that he and the producers just just didn't see this coming. Go! Set it up, set it up, set it up. The task is very simple. One person pours water down the gutters into the barrel. Keep it steady, keep it steady. Fast, fast. Younger tribe has a nice flow. Older tribe with a great flow. Come on, guys, keep it going, keep it going. Keep it going. The third challenge hack, however, is on the opposite end of the spectrum. It is from the finale of season 14, Survivor Fiji. And it happens at the final five immunity challenge where we see a series of giant mazes that the players must navigate through blindfolded. Within each maze, they need to find a station with an appropriate key upon which they take their key and unlock a drawbridge, which takes them on to the next maze. There are four mazes in total and each one is going to be larger and more difficult than the last. Well, that's the idea anyway. For one player named Yao Man, not so much. Yao Man went on to win this challenge and was far ahead of everyone else, despite him being just as blind as everyone else. He was always the first person to each key and each drawbridge, and if you watch the challenge closely, you can tell that the editors had to splice some frames together to make it look like it was closer than it was. But Yao's strategy to completely demolish this challenge was simple. As he would go on to say in a postseason podcast, with most mazes, you can easily find the solution by always sticking to either the left or the right wall. If you just follow either wall and never switch, assuming the maze is closed off, which all four were in this challenge, you just gotta follow the railing and you will eventually reach the exit. You don't have to worry about getting lost because you'll always have your bearing. You're going in one direction that the maze is dictating for you. The railing may lead you in the wrong direction out of the gate, but at least you'll know that you're not lost and retreading old ground. After all, everyone is blindfolded, so if you get mixed up, you might end up like Cassandra here. And it proved to be the prevailing strategy as Yao Man blazed by everyone just by playing it safe. In a challenge held completely in the dark, Perhaps it's better to reach the end eventually than to never reach the end at all. Yao Man has his first key. He's heading out looking for that drawbridge. Yao Man at his first drawbridge. Yao Man takes the lead. Yao Man has his second key. Yao Man at his second drawbridge. Yao Man is at his third key station. Yao Man has found the fourth key station. Yao Man has his fourth drawbridge lowered and he's crossing it looking for his fifth. And final key, Yao Man is at the fifth and final key station. He's unlocking it, lowering it, and crossing it. Yao Man wins immunity. Oh, and also that final, the final base running challenge, just for your information. You saw on TV, it looked like I barely beat him. That's not true. I beat him by a long shot. <laughs>
You know oh. the trick about running bases, right? Blindfolded. Just stay with the same wall and don't change. My hands will cover splinter when I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking that we rotate it, actually. Like, your hands are going to be messed up after that. The next hack is one of the most unique because it was all about communication. Or in the case of the strategy in Season 17, Survivor Gabon, lack of communication. Perhaps a single scene has never better represented a season than when we saw Randy intentionally cross wires and clog up the airwaves by sabotaging the comms of the opposing tribe. For this challenge, the tribes had one player throw a giant ball down a hill to score points at the bottom. At the bottom of the hill were two designated blockers who would attempt to block the opposing tribe's giant balls. Again, gotta have balls, it's a challenge vid, but these blockers were blindfolded because everything is more fun to watch when the players can't see anything. Thing. And then lastly for this challenge, there were designated callers who stood to the side and helped their tribe's blockers who were blindfolded orient themselves to accurately stand guard. Now when you take a step back and you look at this challenge, the normal usual strategy here is pretty basic. As a thrower, you aim in any which direction you can, try to score points. As a blocker, you follow the directions of your caller and move as they direct you. And as a caller, you accurately tell your blocker which direction to go to block the opponent's ball. That is, unless your name is Randy. Then you do what Randy does, and you yell at the other team's blocker to go in the wrong direction, or to just freeze altogether. Because this challenge was dictated by the blockers being in the right position, Randy realized that if he screwed up the other tribe's blocker, his team could easily score every round. So he basically played both offense and defense at the same time. Freeze, ace, freeze, ace, freeze! Right there, right there, right oh, there! Oh, Randy pulls the best one on ace! Then that'll do it! Finally, let's go to a slightly more modern season for a challenge hack that I think almost anyone should consider if you were to play Survivor in a future season. Because what happens here is a tactic that is entirely dependent on the location, and if Survivor plans on staying in Fiji for a while, you're probably going to be set with this creative strategy by the one Michelle Fitzgerald from Season 32, Survivor Korong. Sand. I like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating and it gets everywhere. Wait, what? And that's exactly what Michelle uses to win this immunity challenge at the final seven. It's a memory challenge, kind of like Steven's hack back in season 18 from part one, where the players rush to a giant post out at sea, memorize a bunch of symbols, and then must head back to their station on the beach to decode the correct pattern and unlock their word scramble. The unique strategy here is that once Michelle got back to her station after memorizing the symbols, she immediately grabbed some sand from the beach and used it as a drawing surface to write out the symbols before her. Ty even liked this strategy so much, he looked over and saw her doing it, that he began using it right after her, although his memory failed him as he had to go back out to peek at the symbols one more time. We saw Jason fail to crack the code on his first attempt, meanwhile both Michelle and Julia figured it out right away, unlocked their word scramble, and Michelle went on to win the challenge. And I gotta give props to Julia for just getting it right on her first try, for having good enough memory to not even have to use sand, but I even give more props to Michelle for doing something different and having it lead to a victory. Take any advantage you can get, even if it's something as simple as the sand beneath your feet. There is no rhyme or reason to the symbol or the number that's with it. You gotta find a way in your brain to connect every symbol and lock that number in. Michelle writing her numbers in the sand to lock them in. It would be an impressive win to do it without having to go back. Michelle has hers right. It is now Julia and Michelle, both with a massive time lead as everybody else is still out checking numbers and symbols. If she's right, it would be a big win. Yeah. Say it. Blindsided. Michelle wins individual immunity. Gotta ask. How many numbers were you able to memorize at once? I memorized all of them. Wow. Yeah. That finished so fast. In this challenge on season 33, Survivor Millennials versus Generation X, the three tribes compete in an obstacle course on the water where they maneuver over balance beams and collect bags of coconuts, which then reveal three balls. Two players use these balls to work a hefty table maze. And like most of these obstacle course challenges, it's the table maze at the end that proves to be the most difficult part as it requires both coordination with handling the table and balance on top of a perch that can barely fit 
fit both of your feet. We see all three tribes struggling on this perch, wobbling off of it, throwing the table into disarray. Michaela, however, uses a brute force strategy that on the surface appears less than savory, but is effective and has both her and Hannah crush this challenge, so much so that Michaela then helps another tribe by telling them what she just did. Basically, Michaela's strategy here is to create as much stability as possible with the maze. She tells her partner Hannah, in so many words, to just stop moving. Stay still. This table maze only needs one person to control it, so Hannah just needs to play support. Even though the producers have designed it for two people to control it, each getting their own little controlling stick, that proves itself to not be very optimal. Michaela wants Hannah to keep the maze stabilized so that Michaela can control the direction of the ball. This tactic is so effective that Michaela and Hannah finish way ahead of the other two tribes, making the table look kinda easy. Hey, what do you know? Sometimes one head is better than two. Don't move it, Hannah. Just hold it steady, I'm telling you. Making sure Hannah knows what time it is. I don't need you to move at all. I know, I'm just holding on. Can they do it? Yes. yes. Hannah and Michaela have the lead now. Go down slightly, slightly. Hannah and Michaela have two and a huge Woo, lead. I mark her up. Now, now I need you steady, I need you steady. They're within inches of securing immunity. Lift up slightly. Oh my God. <laughs> And they yeah. have yeah. Hannah and Michaela win immunity. Ikabula is safe. Zeke, Michelle, only one person move it when y'all get past that bar. Kayla now helping Michelle and Zeke. Hey, stop the ball. Michelle and Zeke. Make it stop. Make Close. it stop. Nice save. The Nua could pull this out. It would be a gigantic comeback. Michelle and Zeke got it in a great spot. And they yes. drop yes. it for yes. immunity. Yes. Wow. The second hack is a quick one, but nevertheless worth pointing out because it really saved this player's butt by the end of the challenge and they really needed this win. Kelly Wentworth at the final five challenge in season 31 Survivor Cambodia second chance pulls off a blink and you'll miss it move that pushes her ahead of the pack and ultimately assists in her netting the win. Again, I gotta reiterate, this is a really small and quick hack. For this challenge, it's a massive obstacle course with multiple stations that utilize different skills. Each station rewards puzzle pieces, and once the player completes every station, they can assemble the puzzle in the middle of the challenge to win immunity. But it's important to recognize that players have free agency to go wherever they like, and that not every station is the same difficulty level, and some of these tasks will take longer than others. Out of the gate, right when Jeff says go, Kelly goes for the most difficult station first. And what's more, she's the only player to do so, meaning nobody else can get in her way. Each station is single file, so they can get backed up if more than one player goes to them, which is going to slow you down. This station that Kelly goes to first requires players to use two planks to cross an empty rope bridge, one plank in front of the other. But Kelly doesn't do that. She quickly realizes the ropes are tight enough to hold the player up, and so instead she only uses one plank and just blitzes across the rope like it was nothing. She's basically speed running the station and there's nobody in her way to stop her. Jeff even tells us that this was the most difficult part of the challenge and we see the other four players all complete it the way the producers intended, which was slow. But Kelly's little strategy to get across gave her a huge leg up that allowed her to, as with many of these other hacks, appear to fall behind early on, but then eventually surpass the rest of the competition by the end, eventually leading to her winning immunity as she is the first person to the puzzle and the fastest to complete it. Wentworth takes on one of the toughest ones first. It'll take you some time, but you get it out of the way. Wentworth, she's across, and that will come in handy later when she can make up a lot of time. Question is, will it pay off? Jeremy with three, everybody else with two. Here comes Jeremy with his fifth. He's got one left. Can he keep the lead? Wentworth now coming back with her. Sixth and final bag. Wentworth went for the toughest ones first, and it paid off. Wentworth has all six. She can start working on the puzzle. Wentworth has her first piece. If she's right, she's off to a good start because once you get one piece, things start to lock in. Wentworth with another piece. Wentworth with her eight. Can she get it? Is it right? Wentworth wins in 
individual immunity guaranteed a spot in the final four. The third hack on this list is from season 10 Survivor Palau in episode three in a challenge called Hot Pursuit. And yeah, gotta say, obviously this hack did not come from the Oolong tribe. Shock of the century. But I do wanna say that had this winning strategy from Tom and the Karor tribe not come to exist, we may actually see Oolong win an immunity challenge. I know, I know, a bold claim. Let me explain. There's a giant oval-shaped course in shallow water where both tribes must run around the course and try to catch the other tribe. They can only go clockwise in one direction, so it's a challenge somewhat about speed, but also about endurance. Can you outpace the other tribe? To make it more complicated, the tribes are tied together by rope and each member is carrying a bag with 20 pounds of sand in it. Players can opt out of the challenge at any point, but they gotta give their bag of sand to another player before they do. As you can imagine, between the beating hot sun to the knee deep water to the bags upon bags of sand, it gets really tiring. So is the strategy to sprint out of the gate? Maybe just hope that you're physically stronger and can grind the other tribe down lap by lap. Perhaps you slow burn it to start and then turn on the boosters toward the end, conserve your energy. Many of the physically weaker and more tired players dropped out quickly to give the stronger players a chance to get ahead. But for over half this challenge, the Karor tribe was trailing. They were losing, they were behind. Oolong was shaping up to actually win their first immunity challenge. Until, however, Tom thought outside the oval. Tom realized that because the course was held by the shore and the tide was ebbing and flowing, the water was deeper on one side of the course than the other. He thought on his feet and his newfound strategy was all about timing. It was not about speed or endurance or strength. Every lap when the Karor tribe would hit the shallows, they would sprint, burn as much energy as possible, then, when they hit the deep end, the other side, they would slow down. Lap by lap, this strategy allowed them to maximize their energy usage. Meanwhile, on the other side, Oolong was just going for it at the same speed, at the same time, no rhyme or rhythm. Eventually, these slight gains by Karor, these very subtle touches, put Karor in the lead and eventually gave him the win. <laughs> Walking through this water harder than it looks. Tom now carrying 60 pounds. Tom, Ian, and Greg against Ibrahim, Bobby John, Steph, and James. Oolong trying to make a move. All right, let's have a burst this time. No one's holding us back, all right? We hit the shallows, we dash. Aurora trying to make up a little ground each round. Aurora making up some ground, closing that gap on Oolong. That kicks Oolong into gear. Ibrahim, winded. They ran out. Look at him. They can't even go to the shallows so fast. We can, so let's do it. Oolong really slowing down. Really closing the gap. Oolong gonna have to kick it into gear. Do they have anything left in the tank? Roar making a move. Roar is making up ground in tiny increments. Closing the gap slowly but surely. Roar is making a move. Immunity at stake. Come on! Roar wins their third immunity. Send in out an SOS. We're sending out an SO. Yes, the fourth hack is from the old school SOS challenge. And in this case, it was from season three, Survivor Africa, where both tribes had to create a giant makeshift SOS signal in hopes that they would better garner the attention of the flyby rescue plane, carrying both Jeff Probst and some expert rescue crew. Whichever tribe made the better save our ship, or should I say save our bush fence out of whatever they could find at their camp was would win the challenge. Right away, both tribes began to gather nearby tree branches, rocks, bushes, anything in the vicinity that might lend itself toward making their signal stand out. The Samburu tribe decided to make a massive SOS signal by using their shelter as the O. Both tribes lived in a bush fence, so it was kind of like a third of the challenge was already done for them. They then put together two giant S's and voila, a massive signal but they lost, because that wasn't the hack. The actual hack was on the other side. It was from the Baran tribe. They implemented a two-pronged attack for this SOS challenge. The first was that they did the obvious. They moved away from their camp to a barren area that was highly visible. Nothing obscured their message. There was no mistaking the SOS. And then the second tactic proved to greatly assist in their victory, as this is what the expert remarked upon when he gave them the win. One tribe mate, Kim Johnson, 
brought paints with her to Africa as her luxury item. She took advantage of her luxury item by taking the mosquito nets the tribes were afforded at the start of the game and dipping them each in different colors of paint. She then spread the nets out into massive circles around the SOS signal, which assisted in the signal standing out from the usual environment. While the losing Samburu tribe may not have had paint to take advantage of, it still goes to show how a little creativity and resourcefulness with the tools around you can give you a way with flying colors. Even if it's not what it was intended for, you gotta use every tool in your arsenal. That's the whole point of this hack series. Do whatever you can to get an edge on your competition. If you need something with bright colors, it's gonna attract somebody from a distance. Right. The first thing I think you see rather than movement would even be color. I had brought some acrylic paints with me as my luxury item and suddenly got the idea to take these mosquito nets and make them a bright color and make them almost targets or bullet points. You know, I have a feeling those mosquito nets are gonna be the secret. I think that's our secret ingredient that's gonna win this thing. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Anything to get this challenge. Yes. All right, Harold, that is uh, Samburo tribe. So because it looks just like every other community out here, if you're flying by, you might not notice it at all. Yeah, absolutely right. Okay. Might just it, yeah. Let's take a look at Moran. It's not really uh, getting our attention here. They're using uh, four different colors and the word SOS. Okay, after conferring with our rescue pilot because of the use of color and also the terrain, Moran is the winning try. Which brings us to the fifth and kind of sixth hack. There's two different examples of this unique tactic coming into effect from the same challenge on multiple seasons. So I figured let's include both. The challenge is called Can't Buoy Me Love or Boy Me Love if you're not from the States. It's got a you in there guys, what's going on? This is a simple endurance challenge from season 34 Survivor Game Changers as well as season 37 Survivor David vs Goliath. In this challenge, players must stand on a perch and use two sticks wedged on each side of a buoy to keep it in the air. If you drop the buoy or fall off your perch, you're out. The most difficult part just seems to be how finicky the buoy can get. A slight movement can send it spiraling out of control. You gotta dig deep and focus without tiring yourself out. A lot of emphasis is placed on the wrists as your grip on the sticks is what's keeping the buoy at bay. The successful tactic here is a reversal of most of what we see from these players. It's a reversal of of the norm. Most players in the two instances of this challenge playing out opted to elevate the buoy above their center of gravity using the sticks to face upward. However, two players in Game Changers did something different and go figure, they happened to be the final two players standing by the end. Both Brad and Ty did the opposite of everyone else. They directed their buoys to face at a downward angle, a slightly downward angle, so that as the challenge went on and their muscles began to tire, the buoy would slowly go in the direction of gravity. Everyone else who held their buoy facing upward would have to fight gravity, tiring their muscles faster. Also from my observation, it's also recommended to bring your buoy in close to your body, stabilize your balance, you know, center of gravity and all that. Brand new Survivor Challenge. Somebody here will be the first person to win it. Just like that, in a matter of 30 seconds, we lose four people. It is Michaela, Culpepper, and Ty fighting for immunity. Culpepper squirming, that buoy starting to move, but he is still fighting. And we're down to two. Culpepper and Ty side by side for immunity. Ty drops. Culpepper wins individual immunity. We later saw this challenge return in season 37, David versus Goliath, where Dan, Christian, and Nick did what Brad and Ty did from the previous instance. In fact, Dan even said Brad was his hero at the start of the challenge. Now, Dan went on to win this challenge, but the problem with Nick and Christian's grip was that they held the buoy far from their body. It threw Christian off quickly and Nick collapsed not long after. Jeff even mentions how poorly everyone was doing this time around. Whereas Brad and Ty lasted over 20 minutes, 10 of the 12 players on David versus Goliath dropped out within minutes. We've done this challenge one time in Game Changers. Brad Culpepper won it 23 minutes. It's my hero. Kara is the first one out. Christian drops, he's out. Allison drops, she's out, no shot at immunity. Davey now drops. It's now John in trouble, he drops. Oh. Gabby is out. Carl is out. Oh. Alec oh. loses.
loses his balance, falls off. Alec is out. Mike wobbling. Mike can't recover. We're down to three. A long way away from where Brad Culpepper was when he won it. What is different this time? Angelina and Dan for immunity. Angelina holding hers up, Dan holding his down. Sweat dripping, legs shaking. Angelina's legs twitching. Angelina slipping out of the hole. She's got to recover. That's it. Angelina drops. Dan wins. Many survivor challenges involve bottlenecks, where tribes are forced to clash by design. And never has that been more of a case than in the attack zone challenge, first introduced in season five, Thailand, but later reiterated with season eight, All Stars. And it's the All Stars variant that we're gonna be talking about in this video. This challenge involved players racing across balance beams to grab flags on the other end. Each tribe had two players on the beams at any point in time, and it all came down to, you guessed it, speed and balance. Your tribe needed 20 flags to win, but the catch was that if you ever found yourself bottlenecked face to face with an opposing tribe member in the middle, the two of you would enter the attack zone, where you would need to wrestle your opponent off the beam. First in the water has to restart the course while the winner can keep going. Throughout the challenge, it became apparent that one player was leagues ahead of everyone else, both in speed and balance, but really just speed. Boston Rob. Boston Rob was so fast, he would just dart from one platform to the next like he was floating on air. Compare that to his teammate, Rupert, who I'm not even sure made it to the halfway point at any point in time in this entire challenge, and there is a serious discrepancy in skill. Late in the challenge, the tribes were almost even in flags, and Sue then told her tribe exactly what needed to happen. She told them that she was going to be throwing her spot in the line so Rob could go sooner. Because only two players could go at a time and every player had to compete, this meant time would get wasted with slower players attempting to run the course and then failing. So Sue jumped down, and then everyone else did too. Rob instantly went again and again and again, and then his tribe's victory was never in doubt. Really, the hack here is just to cast your ego aside and let stronger players carry you to victory. No shame, it's a game. Not everyone's good at everything. Do what you gotta do. We saw this creative strategy occur in the next season as well in Survivor Vanuatu, when Scout did the same thing, mercifully sacrificed her spot in a relay race so faster players could run the course sooner. I wouldn't be surprised if this has happened in other seasons throughout the history of the show, but these are just two examples to talk about. Oh. Scout deliberately dumps her juice. New strategy. She's gonna go to the end of the line, let the fast ones run the course. The second act is from season 33, Survivor Millennials vs. Generation X at the final nine in an immunity challenge called Push Me, Pull You. It's a basic challenge involving players holding a steady, firm grip on two handles, applying tension between them to keep a bar in the middle from falling and hitting the ground. If your bar falls, you're out, and the last person left standing wins. At the onset, you might think this challenge is all about strength, or perhaps about your grip strength. Do you have the muscle to keep pressure applied either in your arms or even just your hands? Well, as you would expect for this video, it turns out that didn't matter that much, as we saw Adam go on to win this challenge, someone who I wouldn't say is the most physically superior player out there, beating out the likes of players such as Jay and Ken. If you go back and rewatch this challenge, Adam barely looks like he was struggling. In fact, he was the last person to show any signs of slipping. What Adam did to win this challenge is easy to miss. Simply put, instead of applying pressure inward where you take both your hands and you push them together, forcing the handles against each other, he lifted one hand slightly up and the other slightly down. He applied pressure in opposite directions, locking the bar in the middle in place. Yeah, he still had to maintain tension on both handles, which did require strength, but it took far less of a toll on his grip and ultimately got him the win. This challenge went by quickly, less than four minutes in and most of the cast was eliminated, but Adam used one tiny little maneuver and there you go. A difficult task becomes a lot less so. Three, two, one. And this challenge is on. You start to feel your hands shake a little. David is the first to drop. It looks so easy watching it. Will drops out of nowhere. You just let up for a moment that tension release. And that's what happened to Brett. That is the key, the right finesse. Jay, Ken, and Adam. 
fighting for immunity. Jay with his first movement, but a nice recovery. You have been out here only four minutes. And I know it seems like a lot longer. Adam's still solid. Ken drops and we're down to two. Both guys feeling it. Jay drops, Adam wins. Individual immunity will live to see day 34. I think that I won that challenge not because I was the strongest at like grip strength or whatever, uh, but because I think I figured out the best way to do it that, that other people just didn't figure out. Everyone else was just pulling straight out. I pulled the bottom and pushed at the top and it sort of locked it into place. So I think I could have gone uh, for, for a while there. Cause and effect, the domino effect. The third hack is from the final eight of season 17, Gabon, and it involves the video game player, Kenny, switching up a strategy out of the gate to fall behind early, but eventually go on to take the lead and win the challenge. We've seen this concept talked about in previous videos in this series. A player takes a different approach at the start of a challenge and appears to be in last, but then as the challenge progresses, it turns out that early choice to do something different would put them ahead and ultimately get them to win. This challenge involved players stacking a trail of dominoes across a beam laden with trip wires that, if tripped, would likely cause their dominoes to fall over. The first player to create a trail that would successfully go from the start to the end and trigger their mechanism at the end would win. And it needs to be said, we have seen this challenge play out on six different seasons thus far, and Kenny is the only player to use this different strategy, and what's more, Gabon was the first season to feature this challenge. I'm surprised nobody else has ever watched the tapes. This challenge even showed up on Winners at War. The hack, as usual, is pretty simple. Every player in Survivor outside of Kenny always began to stack their dominoes at the beginning of their beam, quickly adding more down the line. Kenny did the opposite. Right at the beginning of the challenge, he rushed all the way to the end and began stacking first there. Because this challenge was all about speed, Kenny's tactic allowed him to not only literally learn the ropes quicker, but also allowed him to rush to the end with less on the line. If in the event that he was rushing to the end, he triggered the ropes on his way, he didn't have anything to lose because he was starting from the back. While he would still need to cover as much ground as the other players, in his case, every trip back and forth would have less rope to deal with, not more. Kenny was the first to finish his trail, and even though he didn't line up his dominoes perfectly on his first push, he still went on to win the challenge. His unique tactic put him behind early, but eventually proved to be the superior strategy. Maddie, Corinne, starting at the front. Kenny moving to the end, working his way backwards. One wrong move on those trip ropes could knock over everything you've built so far. Do not panic, take your time. <laughs> Maddie seems to have the early lead. Maddie has a bit of a lead. Kenny coming on strong now. Suddenly, Kenny's nearly complete. Jeff, I got it. Kenny's gonna give it a shot. Kenny's go, looking go. good. Go, go, go. Kenny wins immunity. Idle hands make for the devil's tools. Hack number four is all about being first to the punch and not being afraid to go all in. Defense may win championships, but guess what? The offense does too, and quite frankly, it's way more fun if they do. Episode five of season 25, Survivor Philippines, involved a reward challenge where players had to hold a paddle with an idol resting on top and then attempt to knock off their opponent's idol before their opponent did the same thing to them. It was a 1v1, winner take all, get in the mud, get in the pig pen, and just do your best to clobber your opponent. It was a game of chicken, although not with the chicken idol. You had to defend when your opponent struck and eventually strike when you best felt you could catch your opponent off guard. And then of course, cue me saying, or so you would think. Or so you would think. While we saw lots of strategies play out, all involving a bit of O and a bit of D, without a doubt, the best strategy proved to be one involving no defense whatsoever. Pure offense, as quick as possible, surprising your opponent, startling them like a kamikaze bomber, but in a pig pen. We first saw Michael, Mr. Scoops, use this strategy. You throw your idol as high as you can in the air, 
fully knowing it's going to hit the ground. But in that sweet time, that time in between it leaving your paddle and it eventually landing, you propel your body into your opponent's hand and do everything in your power to knock off their idol. We saw Denise do this not long after, as well as Malcolm, who would use this creative strategy to clutch the challenge for his tribe. It turned out that it was less a game of chicken and more a game of quick on the draw. Play fearless and you would drastically increase your odds of scoring a point. On a show that largely predicates itself on playing to not lose, this was a challenge all about playing to win. Oh, Scoop with a nice move. Scores for 10 day. Wow. Denise would like to prove herself right here. Oh, be careful, RC. Denise with a nice job. Palabal scores. Malcolm could make himself very popular, bringing home the reward for 10 day. We even saw this strategy pop up three seasons later in Survivor Kageon when Spencer would go on to replicate the same strategy and win his tribe a point. And you know what, since we're already talking about him, speaking of the young lad, let's save one of the most creative strategies for last. Hack number five is indeed from Spencer Bledsoe, but it happens on season 31, not 28, Survivor Cambodia taking place at the final seven immunity challenge. This challenge had players race across a series of obstacles above water to retrieve a key, then they would race back to the beach to unlock a set of puzzle pieces and the first person to finish their puzzle win. Jeremy proves to be the fastest, first to get to his key and first back to the puzzle, and it turns out the puzzle is only five pieces. Should be a piece of cake, right? How difficult can a five piece puzzle be? You could finish that in like 15 seconds. Well, Jeremy doesn't, but once Spencer gets his puzzle pieces on the table, he literally finishes it in less than 15 seconds. It's almost as if he didn't need to look at the pieces on the board like he already knew the solution before he even opened the bag. Oh yeah, the hack. Let's talk about the hack. How did he do it so quickly? The creative strategy here that netted Spencer the win is one of the most unique in this entire video series. It might be the most, and dare I say it might be the most in the history of Survivor. Prior to going on season 31, Spencer reviewed the tapes and rewatched the latest season, season 30, the one right before, Worlds Apart, and noticed how in the very first challenge in the first episode of that season, the tribes were presented with three different puzzles and they could pick which one they wanted to do. A 50 piece puzzle, a 10 piece puzzle, or a five piece puzzle. For whatever reason, neither of those three tribes chose the five piece puzzle, which meant it went unused and never made air, which meant Spencer took note of this and considered the possibility that it might return in a future season. So upon rewatch, he froze the frame, outlined the puzzle, memorized exactly how to put it together, and then skipped off to compete in season 31, Survivor Cambodia. And what do you know, there was the exact same unused, unaired five piece puzzle from the previous season. I love this creativity, the depths it took to watch it pan out. Props to Spencer, and may I say to any other Survivor superfans out there who may have picked up on the producers reusing old challenges. I'll just reiterate that every detail counts, utilize everything you can within reason to get ahead. You are not out of this challenge because there is no working closer and closer. This is the kind of puzzle you solve in an instant and Spencer just did. I gotta tell you, we have tested that puzzle a lot. Nobody ever has done it that fast, ever. That was amazing. Spencer memorized the, the puzzle from season 30, paused it on his TV, traced it on a piece of paper, cut it out, and did it himself. Like I was in the lead, and I put a couple different things together, trying, and then he comes over and boom, blue, blue, done. What a nerd, such a nerd. Pearl Islands, episode 13, the final five. In a challenge called Corks and Keys, the players have to use a small canteen to collect some water and then deposit the water into a thin tube. As the tube fills with water, a float with a key attached will slowly surface. When it's high enough, you grab the key, unlock your next plank, and you keep going. You have to repeat this process five times, releasing five planks to grab a flag at the end of the course and get back to the finish. And the first player back to the finish with their flag wins. 
begins. It needs to be said, you can only refill your canteen at the starting plank, meaning you have to tread more ground the further you make it into the challenge. Dara's creative strategy to win this challenge proves to be very efficient. It's also a simple maneuver, as they tend to be in this video series. The tubes with the keys are thin and long, so it looks like you're gonna need to do several trips to fill it up with a bunch of water so that you can actually reach the key. Well, after just one trip, one dumping the water from her canteen into the tube, Dara forced her hand, her wrist, and the length of her arm all the way to the bottom of the tube, grabbed her key, and kept going. This saved her a ton of time as she only needed to make five trips total, one for each tube, to win the challenge. I give Dara credit here because it doesn't seem likely the producers intended for the challenge to be so simple. Likewise, we later saw that both Johnny Fairplay and Lil could pull off the same technique to get their key, only needing one trip, but it was Dara who pushed on and forced her hand into the tube despite it not being all that comfortable, before anyone else bothered to go the extra mile. Dara did it first, nabbed a lead, and proved to the others that it was possible winning the challenge because of it. Also, props to Burton for attempting to use his canteen to fish out a key. Had it worked, you probably would be seeing it on this list. Going even further old school for this next one, and it is probably one of my favorites, just for how simple of a unique strategy it is. Seriously, this is gonna be really, really simple. In episode five of season three, Survivor Africa, we saw two tribes compete in a reward challenge for a bunch of chickens. The challenge itself wasn't that complicated. Each tribe had a herd or tribe or trip of goats. Apparently groups of goats can be called many things. So I will be saying each tribe had a tribe of goats that they had to herd or trip um, from one pen to another. There were 40 goats in total and each tribe had 20 designated goats. As you could imagine, the difficulty with this challenge was simply getting the goats to do what you wanted them to do. Your tribe had to lead them in the right direction while also avoiding your opponent's players who were sometimes getting in the way, blocking you off, or distracting your goats from going in the right direction. After a short period of time, Silas and Clarence from the Yellow Buran tribe realized these goats aren't that big. There's no rule against taking matters into our own hands. So instead of herding the goats, they just picked them up and carried them to the designated pen. They also then got Ethan and Frank, two of their other tribe members, to follow suit, and this proved to be a great strategy. The Red Tribe, on the other hand, took a long time to attempt this, instead opting to herd the goats the usual way, just yelling at them and smacking a twig on the ground. Amusingly, Big Tom, who was on the Red Tribe, the losing tribe, was a goat farmer, and he lost the challenge involving goats. You guys know what they say, rule number 56 of reality television if a challenge fits your profession, you're probably not gonna win it. Got 40 goats in there, they've been marked. 20 with Samburo colors, 20 with Baran colors. First try to get their 20 goats into their own pin at the finish line, wins the reward. <laughs> What do you got, Teresa? Twenty. Ron wins. You know what? Speaking of Big Tom, despite not winning that goat challenge, let's give him some credit for what he pulls off in episode 14 of season eight, Survivor All Stars where he goes on to use a small, subtle technique that keeps his chances of winning this challenge alive and ultimately nets him the immunity necklace. For this challenge, the players have two buckets on either end of a seesaw and they need to create a fire in one bucket and then fill up the second bucket with water. When the second bucket is full of water, it'll raise the fire bucket in the air and light the fuse. First player to light their fuse wins. Each player is given an armful of kindling and a box of matches to create their fire, but it's important to note that if a player runs out of matches, they automatically lose the challenge. Likewise, the water bucket has a hole in its side which slowly drains the water from it, meaning you need to constantly run back and forth refilling your bucket of water to lift your fire bucket higher. But you also need to tend to your fire bucket to ensure the fire is staying alive, otherwise you end up with what happens to Boston Rob. He gets a small fire going, fills up his water bucket really quickly, but 
then the fire isn't strong enough to light the fuse when it gets to the top. He then has to wait for his water bucket to empty, and by the time his fire gets back to him on the ground, it's practically dead. That's the key to this challenge. Don't get eager and assume your fire will stay alive while you work on the water bucket. There's only so many matches and so much kindling you're given, so don't waste it. And that's what Big Tom ensures he doesn't do. Whereas we saw Rob, Amber, Jenna, and Rupert all create weak fires and eventually run out of matches, Tom keeps his fire alive by doing one little thing differently. He takes some of his kindling and sticks and rests them on top of his bucket, which meant that while he made the necessary four or five trips to fill up the water bucket, his fire was guaranteed to stay high enough and alive enough, that's the most important part, to not die on him while he tended to getting that fire in the air. This proved to easily be the most effective strategy, and I think it more than made up for him losing that goat challenge. The fourth unique tactic is from an international season of Survivor, which, I know, is a whole nother can of worms we're opening. It's from Australian Survivor, and if you haven't seen the season, I will pretty much be keeping this spoilers incredibly light. But if you're a fan of the American version, I would highly recommend checking out the show if you can find a way to watch it somewhere online. In episode 13 of Australian Survivor All-Stars, we see two tribes compete in a challenge that is reminiscent of an American Survivor challenge. It's a challenge called A Bit Tipsy, and it involves players balancing blocks on a wobbly base held up by a rope where the players must slowly move back and forth, balancing their base with the blocks while stacking them. The first tribe to have every member successfully stack their three blocks wins. We've seen this challenge a lot on modern American Survivor, starting with season 27, Blood vs. Water, and ending with season 40, Winners at War. I actually covered a version of it in Challenge Hacks 1.0 in this video series with a tribe dynamic, and I did go back and do my homework. I checked each American season to see if any player pulls off this little technique in the Australian version, and nobody does. And I'm not sure if that's because there's like a rule set in place to prevent them from doing so, or in some cases because the challenge was tweaked and they just straight up couldn't, but either way, it's unique to this season of Australian Survivor, so let's give it an odd. As I was saying, the players here had to balance three blocks on top of each other, but the blocks were lightweight. I think lighter than any other iteration of this challenge, and it proved to be a constant pain as nobody could manage to balance them. After so many times having their blocks fall, a player named Harry decided to change one thing ever so slightly that proved to have a huge difference. Because the blocks were tall and kept falling forward or backward, he realized giving them more support in the direction they were falling would make them more stable. So he rotated his blocks 45 degrees, allowing the corner to serve as support for when the base leaned in either direction. This made the challenge a fair bit easier for him, and he was able to make his way to the finish line, having stacked three blocks successfully a lot quicker. His tribe mates AK and Shawnee also followed suit right after, finding success with this strategy as well, which led to his tribe winning immunity. We even went on to see a few members of the other tribe attempt to copy them, although they lacked patience, something you really need with this challenge, and thus were kinda screwed no matter what. The smallest of tweaks can make a huge difference. Okay. Harry, placing his third block. AK places his second. Shawnee dumps her entire stack. She's gonna have to start over. And that's it. Harry's good. He's back behind the start line. Now it's up to Shawnee. Just do you, Sean. Shawnee placing the final block for Vakama. Can she get it to stick? Her stack is looking good. Now she needs to get back to the start line. Johnny, one more inch and that's it! For the last creative strategy, let's bring it back to a player featured in a previous video in this series and talk all about Adam Klein from Season 33, Survivor Millennials vs. Generation X. In every case highlighted in this series for all six parts thus far, we have focused on players using strategies to win challenges, but what if we shift our perspective a bit and talk about defensive strategies not so much to win a challenge, but instead to guarantee 
other players don't. In Adam's case, in the bigger picture, his winning endgame strategy was to have a herd of bigger threats to ensure there was always someone ahead of him to be voted out in the pecking order. By the final seven, there were several threats left, particularly Jay and David, and in the episode 12 immunity challenge, Adam focused less on having himself win it and more on ensuring anyone but those two players won. After all, I'm not sure if you heard, but Jay did have an immunity idol, and Adam did one at flushed. Jay does have an idol. Jay does have an idol. Does have an idol. Jay does have an idol. Jay has an idol. We know Jay has an idol. I can confirm Jay has an idol. Jay does have an idol. Jay has an idol. So Jay has an idol. This challenge was called Pinball Wizard, a reference to The Who, and it involved dividing your attention between rolling a ball down a pachinko contraption while also assembling a 25-piece puzzle. So long as your ball was headed down the slope, you could work on the puzzle, but if you didn't catch the ball before it hit the bottom in the gutter, you would have to wait for the ball to go down a series of long slopes or gutters, which took a lot of time away from finishing your puzzle. When you're so focused on your puzzle, sometimes you slip up for just a second and it costs you dearly. Midway through the challenge, Adam realized that he likely wasn't going to win this, but there was a chance either Jay or David could. So instead, what Adam did here was abandon his puzzle and focus solely on helping his ally Ken stay alert on the location of his ball. When Ken's ball was close to the gutter, Adam would alert Ken to go back and save it. This allowed Ken to save time and be more efficient with putting his puzzle together, and really, it removed half the difficulty of the challenge simply by teaming up. And yeah, this defensive strategy strategy worked, Jay didn't win, and his idol was flushed later that night, and that was the main point of the strategy. Ken, I'm gonna tell you when your ball is dropping. Keep working. Ken is still wrong. Ken gonna try again to change it. Ken, come back. Ken, come back. Ken, come back. Whoa, nice hit by Ken. Really, Adam? Ken wins! Individual immunity! Safe wow. from the vote! And then let's fast forward to the final four immunity challenge of the same season, Millennials Gen X, with Adam, Ken, David, and Hannah. Using the same mantra as the previous example that we just talked about, Adam didn't want David to win immunity, so he pulls off a subtle technique that practically guarantees David won't win it. For this challenge, players had to navigate bowls through a maze and then balance them at the top of a wobbly pedestal. The first player to balance all 13 bowls, or the player who had the most bowls in place after 30 minutes would be the winner. Because there was a lot of wind, the bowls easily fell, especially the higher you stacked them, costing a lot of time. And Adam took note of this and again played defensively, not to ensure that he would win immunity, but to ensure his target wouldn't. Several times throughout the challenge, Adam would have the lead and then stop competing. He would have 10 bowls or eight bowls and then stop. And just stand there. He could have kept stacking to get to 13, but that would increase the risk of the wind knocking them over, putting David ahead of him. So he waited for David, who was behind him, to potentially catch up. At one point, both Hannah and Ken were ahead of Adam with 10 bowls each, but Adam still did nothing even though he only had eight. And that was all because David only had seven. Until David caught up, Adam didn't need to make an unforced error. By the end of the 30 minutes, both Ken and Hannah had 10 bowls each, Adam's still at eight, and at that point, it didn't matter who won between Ken or Hannah in the tiebreaker. David didn't have enough to even stack up to Adam's eight, so he therefore wasn't going to win. David was the bigger threat, and because of Adam's defensive technique, he was eligible to be voted out. And to Adam, in all likelihood, he just won the season. Ken is going for number 12 while Adam just watching. Adam now stepping off his platform. Adam's strategy worked. David now working on his sixth, and Adam is sitting on eight. Adam just watching, once again, taking the defensive position in this game to let somebody else mess up. Adam will only win if both Hannah and Ken drop. That is it. We are tied 10-10. We will have a showdown between Hannah and Ken. I'm sorry that I was rooting against you so hard at the immunity challenge, but I basically gave up my shot at immunity just to make sure that you didn't win. If they don't vote you out, I lose the game. So what does it matter? In episode eight of season 41, at the reward challenge, Evie saw what the puzzle was and was like, put me in coach, I've got a dragon to slay. In this challenge, the players had to dive into the water, unhook four buoy puzzle pieces, 
put them in a boat and drag them to a floating platform. And with only four pieces, you would assume this should be a pretty easy puzzle, but just like Spencer's puzzle from season 31, there's a reason it was used and it can be quite difficult. It's an abstract 3D puzzle, and if you go back to the only other time that it was used in Survivor, which was season 38, we saw three tribes all struggle to complete it. We actually saw one of the biggest challenge comebacks in Survivor history, all because this buoy puzzle stumped two whole tribes, allowing the third one to get back in the game. But Evie is a fan of Survivor and is really, really smart, and they did their homework. The day that Evie was going to fly to Fiji to compete on season 41 in this season, that same day, they put together with some beads in their house, this exact same pyramid puzzle. Because Survivor producers love to reuse challenges, and even though this one has only ever been done once, it can't hurt to practice it a few times. Dare I say, if you are going to be on a recent season of Survivor, it doesn't hurt to go back a few seasons and just study some of the puzzles that are pretty new. You're building a pyramid yeah. puzzle yeah, while wow, Evie very quickly is taking over this puzzle. Boom, done. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. I remember watching this on Edge of Extinction. I remember that tribe sucking so bad and then they pulled out this puzzle and I was like, I can make that puzzle out of beads in my house. And I did and it paid off. After the game, like one of the producers said to me, like, I thought that something broke in the challenge. Like, like, cause it just like, so quick. This next hack is from a player who I'm surprised has yet to make an appearance in this entire video series. The hack is from a challenge called Hard to Handle. It's been played three times in Survivor, first in season 28, next in season 31, and most recently in season 41. This is a challenge where players stand on a declining narrow beam and hold a pole with a small platform. On top of the platform, they have to balance a ball for as long as possible, and the last player to not drop their ball wins. To make it more difficult, after a period of time, the player Players have to make their way down the beam as it gets increasingly narrower. They also have to hold their pole on a lower portion of the handle, making it more difficult to balance the ball. And in spite of me breaking down this explanation, the unique strategy is quite simple, and I'm surprised that we just don't see it more often. In the three times this challenge has happened, it has only ever been utilized once, and given the aforementioned fact that Survivor loves to reuse challenges, I'm expecting it to return soon, so I hope someone out there tries this strategy out. The common strategy is for everyone to stand facing forward at a decline. They focus ahead of themselves with their weight centered on both feet. But Joe did something different. For the first two rounds, he stood facing sideways using one of his feet as the anchor, shifting his weight behind him. And for the final portion, the narrowest part of the beam, he practically faced backwards. This made the challenge appear a lot easier, whereas many players throughout every iteration of this challenge dropped out quickly after the transition to the next part, particularly the last part, Joe stayed steady throughout. It's the little things in the background that most people don't pay attention to that can make a world of a difference. This is a challenge in which if you stop thinking about what you're doing, even for a moment, that is all it will take and you'll be out. You're now gonna move down to the second level. It is more narrow and you're gonna move your hand down farther on the pole. Two newbies to this challenge, Joe and Jeremy, Two veterans, the only people who played this challenge, Spencer and Tasha, who will win today? And we are down to two just like that. It is Joe and Spencer. Another recovery, but he can't do it. Spencer drops. Joe wins first individual Yay! immunity. Speaking of the background, this next one is brought to you by the player who does the hack, actually giving commentary on their challenge strategy from the DVD box set. This next hack is from a classic Survivor challenge that has been used many times, dating all the way back to season three and was also featured on season 40, Winners at War. The challenge is called When It Rains, It Pours, and it's an endurance challenge that speaks for itself. Players stand on a tiny platform with their hand raised in the air and their wrist is shattered to a giant bucket above their head. If they drop their arm, the bucket falls on them and they're out. It's a test of withstanding the pain, the discomfort, and just being patient and focused. The unique strategy comes from the second iteration in season eight, All Stars, when Sheehan would go on to win this challenge after battling it out against Rupert and after a few hours of her arm going completely numb. Sheehan did several things right, so let's run down the list. In 
And by the way, like I said, this all comes straight from Shein herself as she talks about this on the All Stars DVD. So yeah. I'm trash talking a lot during this challenge. It's true. Yes, you are. I'm trash talking a lot. You're doing whatever you can, but yeah, it wasn't because... making any sense. First, she was the only player in the bunch to use her left arm instead of her right because her right arm was sore going into the challenge. Second, she knew that focus was important, so she emphasized never closing her eyes, doing so as infrequently as possible. The pain will make you wince, which causes you to drift and sway. She couldn't afford to do that. Third, she wrapped her buff around her wrist to provide padding against the shackle. Alicia attempted to do something similar with her jacket, but she said that she found it cumbersome and stiff. I think it was smarter to go with the buff as the buff isn't attached to anything else that's attached to your body. And fourth, and most importantly, she kept her elbow locked and her arm straight the entire time. There's a reason muscular players tend to fare worse in endurance challenges, and this is why. Muscles fatigue, they weigh you down, but if you lock your elbow and keep it that way, it's all in the bone keeping you up. Most players in this challenge bend their elbow and their triceps eventually spasm, but with this technique, it softens the blow. Also, it helps if you just don't have a lot of muscle, but it's what you do with that lack of muscle that makes the difference. And Shein made the best of this and won immunity right when she needed it most. I train for a challenge like this, and what it is, it's all about it's skeletal. All about you this. gotta get your arms you straight. You gotta go straight. Yep, that's what you that's have to what do. You did, that's Shein. exactly what yeah. I did. Yeah. <laughs> also, I was one that switched arms. I switched arms. I had a chance to put up my right arm or my you know left what arm. Happened? This arm actually hurt less. My, and time. everyone yeah. has their yeah. elbows it was rough. Bent, bent. Except no, for me. No, but see, that's what I mean. Everybody skeletal. has their elbows You go elbows bone bent. to bone on endurance challenges. Yep. You lock them. This fourth hack is not the biggest brain strat of the bunch, but it's still worthy of a mention. It happens in episode 11 of season 14, Survivor Fiji, the original Fiji, and it takes place during a challenge called Torched or Battleship. Was Battleship trademarked? Either way, it's Battleship. Players have to hide a three square boat on a five by five grid, either vertically, horizontally, or diagonally. One by one, players take a shot at the board, hoping to sink the other players' battleships or torch them. The last player standing wins. Players are also given a mini board that shows where successful hits have occurred, but they don't tell you exactly who was hit. They also don't tell you who made a miss. This is a challenge about precision and memory, making sure you remember where your ship is, where successful hits have occurred, and likewise where misses have happened too. And if you kind of laugh at the fact that remembering where your ship is is something that needs to actually be considered, throughout the challenge, several players accidentally waste their turn on an already shot space only to miss, and even a few of them hit their own ship unintentionally. What do you know? You starve yourself for 30 days, you're gonna start to forget some things. And even though a few of them did unintentionally hit their ship, one player did so intentionally. And that is what we're talking about. Come the final few rounds, Stacy was ahead of two players by one space. The way the board broke down, there were a few spaces where their ships could have still been, but Stacy was paying attention and recognized that in order to win, she had to do something that seemed counterintuitive on the surface, but was necessary to win given the circumstances. She shot herself. She realized, given the board state, that in order to win, she had to chance it and shoot at her own ship, knowing both Yao Man and Alex were in the vicinity and only had one space left. And she was right to do so because she sunk both of their battleships with that last shot and went on to win immunity. Yao Man and Alex, each with one square left. Stacy. D4. D4 is a hit. Everybody takes a hit. A good strategic move as Stacy hits herself, but in the process takes out both Yao Man and Alex. Stacy wins individual immunity. They say time flies like an arrow, but fruit flies like a banana. Well, this last hack is from season 17, Gabon, episode four, and a reward challenge called fruit flies. And honestly, that's the hack. More flying fruit. This challenge involved players tossing fruit between a hole in a wall to a tribe mate on the other side. They had to do this twice, but the difficulty was that the opposing tribe had players with sticks trying to whack that flying fruit out of the air. But if the fruit made it through both walls, it would go in the tribe's basket and the tribe with the heavier basket after five minutes was the winner. Early in the challenge, the yellow-coated tribe was getting their ass handed to them. Mostly because of this guy. 
guy, because of Ace. He was a fantastic blocker for the Red Fong tribe. He just kept smacking the Coda fruit down, one after another. Meanwhile, Maddie and Kenny on the Fong tribe on the other side were proving to be a lethal combination. But then Marcus on the Yellow Coda tribe realized something. The way to win this challenge wasn't through accuracy. It was through the success rate of the fruit getting past players like Ace. Because each tribe was provided with more than enough fruit to toss for the five minutes, Marcus did two things differently. First, he began to prioritize only the bigger fruit, and second, he began to throw two fruit to Dan, his other tribe member trying to catch them at once. And once Dan would catch these fruit from Marcus, he would then throw both fruit at the same time to Randy, who was also on his tribe catching on the other side. This meant that even if Ace was able to block one of them, the other heavy fruit would still get through the wall. Whereas the other tribe was spending lots of time and energy chucking lots of little fruit, Marcus ensured what little time they had in this challenge was put to effective use. This little technique proved to be the winning strategy as Coda, the yellow tribe, went on to win despite being down early in the challenge. Dan, throw two pieces at once. Dan has two pieces of fruit. That one connects. Dan has half a watermelon and a pineapple. Catches the half a watermelon. Two minutes left. 16 pounds for Fong. Not bad. This is what you have left. By two pounds, Coda wins the war. Also, okay, I guess I will say accuracy is somewhat important because of, well, what happens right here. Dan has a watermelon and a pineapple. Annihilates Ace. Good news is Ace, nothing got through. Hey, pegging people with fruit. In episode five, there is a tribal immunity challenge where the players run a relay race going further into the jungle. There's three pairs of players and each subsequent pair will face a larger obstacle to retrieve some puzzle pieces. The players then return back to their mat, solve the puzzle, and there you go. Out of the gate, the red Fong tribe falls behind. And so when Maddie and Kenny start the third and final part of the race, they have got some ground to make up. Not only that, but they're up against Marcus and Dan, who were two guys that were featured in the previous hack video, 7.0, from a unique strategy they pulled off in the previous episode. This matchup is a bit like David versus Goliath, except drop your expectations because Maddie and Kenny crush it here. The third obstacle is a big wooden mess of logs that the players have to climb through. We saw the previous pairs for the second part of the race climb under that one or step through it, but Maddie and Kenny take a different route. Simply put, they don't go under or through it, they go over. Like walking on air, they hop across the top and overtake Marcus and Dan, then retrieve the puzzle pieces faster and get back to their mat, having equalized their position in the challenge. All because of this one simple tactic. And then of course it wouldn't be Fong without Fong showing up. Their tribe blew the puzzle, way to go Fong, way to go. Second creative strategy comes from one of the most well-known Survivor superfans, and that is John Cochran on season 26, Kara Moen, Fans versus Favorites 2. At the final four, there's a reward challenge called House of Cards, where players have to hold up a bunch of cards on one end of a balance beam while building a house of cards on the other end. They're given a whole bunch of cards to use, and they have a lot of time to build upward. And the first player to build a tower high enough to reach the marker wins. Now, we have seen the specific version of this challenge three times in Survivor history, most well known in Season 23, South Pacific, when Ozzy clutched it against all odds. We also saw it 11 seasons seasons later in Game Changers with Aubrey. This challenge proves itself to be a pain. Not only is it tricky to build a tower high enough without it falling over from poor placement or your breath, but also you have to move your body back and forth from one side of the beam to the other to grab a new card to place. The movement that you're forced to make causes the platform to wobble and really you have no one to blame but yourself. But one thing we see Cochrane do that really gives him the edge and the win is when he places just enough of his cards in the middle beam so that he can build his entire structure without ever having to reach back and forth from one side to the other. He reduces the gap that his body has to move significantly and what's more, he eyes just how many pieces he needs to reach the top and then builds his tower with only one piece to spare. Mind you, he had several more pieces he could have used, but that would have wasted time and clearly they weren't necessary. We did see other players on this season attempt this maneuver too, particularly Sherry who tried to do what Cochrane was doing. However, she did not bring as many pieces and was forced to move back to the other side of the beam, which caused her to lose the challenge. 
What's the best approach to build a solid foundation that can withstand a house of cards high enough to reach that red line? The higher it gets, the more precarious it gets. And that's how quickly it can tumble. Cochran with one slight move, and it happens to Sherry. Sherry's now starting over. It's going to take a very light touch, which she might have. But no, Don loses her entire stack. Eddie loses half his stack. Sherry with another card. Cochran with another card. He is one card away. It would be his third individual challenge win. Cochran wins. Advantage. In episode five of season 32, Ko Rong, hack number three is so subtle that you might just miss it. Certainly, Anna and Peter did as they blew a lead at the puzzle portion of this challenge to Neil, who completely aced them where it mattered. In this challenge, the players retrieve puzzle pieces by doing some physical activity. It's not really important or the part of the challenge that mattered here. Let's just put it this way. They did stuff to get puzzle pieces that were shaped like fish, at which point they passed off the fish pieces to two of their puzzle making tribe mates. And this is the part that matters. We see Peter and Anna start the puzzle for the yellow tribe and not far behind them are Neil and Debbie on the blue tribe. Right away, Neil begins to assemble the pieces like he's done this puzzle in his sleep, and unlike other fast puzzle solvers, this was the first time Survivor had ever used this particular puzzle, so it's just all the more impressive what happens here. This puzzle has 14 pieces with two layers, seven pieces on top and seven on bottom. Right away, Neil cracked the code by noticing that four of the pieces had a unique extra feature to them. They had an extra fin on top. Neil deduced that these pieces were on each end, and from there he built the puzzle with those starting pieces in mind. When you flip to the yellow tribe, they have no idea what they're doing or looking at, but then you look at Neil and he's got the face of the most confident man in Cambodia, or at least on this beach. Neil aces the puzzle so fast because of this little maneuver, and before you know it, he's won the challenge. 14 puzzle pieces. Get them all on that table before you start working on the puzzle. Neil and Debbie have done a lot of work on puzzles. No. Chan Lo has a lot of pieces down. It can fool you. Neil and Debbie making a lot of progress if they they're got right. We got it, Jeff. We got it. Neil and Debbie think they have it. Immunity. Yeah. And they get up there. They had three pieces down, and it was done. Like. What? I also quickly want to mention that this same puzzle was used in Game Changers two seasons later, and uh, I looked at that version of this puzzle, and the players had to build the layers side by side instead of stacking them on top of each other. And when Jeff went to check to see if the tribes had completed the puzzle correctly on that season, I noticed that he slapped the four unique pieces to confirm they were correct. I think this was Jeff's way of knowing that the tribes had it right, which only confirmed to me how good Neil was in this puzzle two seasons prior. Also fun little fact is that Michelle was on Neil's tribe on season 32 when he solved this puzzle, and then she went on to solve the same one on season 40, so I wonder if she picked up any points from her first time out. The fourth creative strategy is for one of my favorite types of challenges that I just don't really talk about very often, and that is social challenges. Similar to a competition in one of my Big Brother Compact videos where an alliance rigged a competition by selecting the same answer to force a majority, this time around in Survivor, we are looking at one of the oldest challenges in the books. It's called Fallen Comrades, and it was only used five times ever. In the first four seasons, we saw it used at the end of the season. We actually saw V uh, big brain this challenge like crazy in the 2.0 video that I made way back when, when she used her journal to jot down information for this specific challenge? Well, after V did that, the producers never brought the challenge back until season 29, San Juan del Sur. In episode 11 at the final eight, this trivia challenge about previously voted out players returned one more time to see if it had any magic left in the tank. Turns out, it doesn't. At least, I don't think it does. And it's because of what the Fab Five Alliance of Natalie, Missy, Baylor, John, and Jacqueline accomplish that sees it entirely dead in the water, its skull crushed for all eternity. Like many challenges, this one's pretty simple. Jeff asked the players a trivia question about previously voted out players. The question is something random about who they are, their job, their family, what have you. If you get the question right, you can chop another player's rope. And after a player receives three chops, said player is eliminated. 
illuminated. And mind you, this challenge is similar to the Q&A challenge we've seen a bunch of times as well, but because it's trivia about the players, it's more fallen comrades than it's those Q&A ones. After two rounds, the Fab Five Alliance have swiftly eliminated the three players on the bottom, Reed, Alec, and Keith. It was as straightforward and hassle-free of a challenge as you can get. Once those three are out, Natalie isn't sure who to hit next, so she turns and asks her alliance what to do. To whom do they want to give the challenge? Wait, hold on, Natalie, what? This challenge is intended to sow discord and chaos. It's supposed to reveal where your loyalties lie, what the pecking order looks like of your alliance. But what it's not supposed to do is bring you closer to them. Right away... Jeff hates this. Because the producers created these really cool skulls with fake blood that oozes out when they get crushed, and this is making a mockery of all that. And wouldn't you know it, that's the creative strategy here. It's a social strategy that you never see come up in Survivor, ever. An alliance dominates a social challenge and then just decides who wins. All five of these players go around the producers and subvert their expectations and make for terrible TV in the process. And yes, if there is one thing Jeff Probst hates more than anything, it's terrible TV. He hates when the players get cute with production and outthink them. Which is why he then decides if the players aren't going to shake things up with this challenge designed to do just that, then he's going to do it in instead. And in a weird way, what happens next after the challenge is over is akin to that same alliance that hacked this challenge, failing the challenge. Jeff talks, he probes, he makes some good points. The alliance begins to crack. Perhaps it's Jeff himself who is the biggest challenge of all. And with that, oh, that's so very gross. symbolic in blood versus Jeff, water, look. that Reed is I now know, right? covered in yeah, blood, fine. his skull crushed. John doesn't hesitate. Alec, out of this game. I'll try. Keith already heading over. He knows it's coming. What are we going to do? A lot of talking going over there, Alec, Reed, and Keith. Yeah, you guys oh. got two and, yeah. and are you going to go to exit? Guys... Is this going to be a friendly, we're just going to see how this goes between the five of you for the rest of this challenge? Probably, Probably. so. Why are we wasting our time? The final creative strategy for 8.0 is digging deep, and I mean really, really deep. We are talking about season 33, Millennials versus Gen X. In the finale, when everything is on the line for Jay and he has got the lead in the immunity challenge, he's gotta win it, it's do or die, and then he forgets to cover up his lock combo and he gives the rest of the tribe a chance to sneak a peek at his answer, which shortens the lead he had. Damn it, Jay. You had one job, put the flap on. Here's the deal. This final creative strategy is something everyone should consider doing if they have the opportunity because it can make a noticeable difference in any given challenge. In this particular challenge, the players eventually encounter a lockbox with three numbers they need to input to pull a key out. Once they do so, they can then move on in the challenge. What needs to be known is that the producers usually provide each player with a flap that the players can put over their combination once they figure it out. Jay doesn't do this, and once he finds the answer first, he moves on, but David quickly, unabashedly, runs over and glances at Jay's combination to save himself the time of trying to figure it out himself. This is a similar strategy I've talked about in one of my Big Brother videos. Let the other players do your work for you, then take advantage of the time they used for you to get ahead. Or, in David's case, to catch up to Jay. Because once David does this, the rest the rest of the tribe then does it too, revealing that it's an allowed strategy that was preventable. The producers provided a flap for a reason. David eventually gets to the puzzle at the end and finishes it ahead of Jay, granting him immunity. We even see Adam try to copy David's puzzle to see if he could outpace David at the very end. But he did not cover it up! David takes advantage of it! Everybody is now looking! It is chaos! Big error by Jay! He's got a cover he could have used, and he didn't. David with another piece. Adam now looking at David's puzzle, trying to get some help. Jay, almost there. Oh. Jay loses everything. Jeff! David Jeff. thinks he has it. David wins! And while you're probably thinking, Pridium, that's really all you're gonna tell me, peeking, 
that's it. That's all you're going to give me here. I went back over the past 10 or so seasons since Survivor planted itself in Fiji to see how often these combo locks appear and how often these anti peaking flaps come with them. Did anyone else ever do this? And yes, I know this is a little bit much. Just bear with me. From season 33 to season 40, this lock box has appeared eight times in those eight seasons. Some seasons it hasn't appeared. Other times it's appeared more than once. But yeah, of those eight times, six of them did not have a flap. But also six of them were done with tribes, not individual. So maybe that changes things. We did see Debbie and Game Changers rearrange her combination to avoid the other tribe copying her just as we saw Yule in Winners at War pull off the same maneuver. Season 38 is the only other time this lockbox was individual in Fiji, but the boxes had different combinations, so peaking really wouldn't matter. Amusingly, however, we did see a big commotion pop up in David vs. Goliath when Allison began feeding failed answers to Christian to help him save time. This turned into a frenzy very quickly. Orange did not 36. cover their combo. 18, Allison may have picked no, it off. 36, blank 27, 18. 27, 36, 18. 36, 18, hey, what did I tell you? I said we're gonna dig deep. I was curious about the combinations of these lockboxes. Was there ever a pattern to them? It turns out there is. I had noticed the producers constantly reuse the same number season after season. In fact, from the finale of season 33 to season 37, the same combination was used every season. 36, 27, 18. It was also used for one of the two lockboxes in season 38. And given that we know that the producers love to reuse challenges, it's only fitting that that's the case here too. And as I was digging all of this up, I came across a Twitter thread from a man named Ryan Barry. I wanted to give him a shout out because he went even deeper into all of this and organized all of the data into a handful of tweets. I thought it was really cool and applicable to future contestants. And what's more, somehow this player found a way to sneak into this video as if he weren't already in any more of my previous hack videos I found the one and only Adam Klein at the bottom of the Twitter thread explaining his strategy to tackle the lockbox that we see him do in the premiere episode of season 40, Winners at War. And while Adam does get a bit unlucky with his lockbox combo, there is still a bit of luck to this whole thing in the end. His blue Sele tribe manages to come from behind to win the challenge. I would like to think that he should at least get some credit for doing his homework. Yeah! And Jeremy does it! Sally has her second ring. You got this, Jeremy. Jeremy, for the win. <laughs> and he's got it. Yeah. Sally wins yeah. a in episode seven, we saw the infamous outcast tribe emerge from the jungle to rejoin the rest of the cast and compete against them in a challenge. If the outcast won this challenge, they would get to vote two people back into the game, but if they only beat one tribe, they would get to vote one person back. And if they lose, then they just go on their pre-jury trip. It's one of the most unique twists in Survivor history. The stakes were incredibly high. For the first time ever, players could come back into the game after being voted out. The challenge itself involved three parts. The first part was a quick run to the beach to grab the tribe flag and then run back to the three cages. Inside the cages were tied up tribe mates. So for the second part, the player who grabbed the flag had to then dig under the cages to get inside, untie their tribe mates to release them, at which point these tribe mates all had to dig under the next cage and so on. Part three of the challenge began in cage two where the players had to fashion together a wobbly pole out of bamboo. They would use the pole to retrieve a set of keys that would unlock the second cage and then they would use the pole again to unlock the third cage by retrieving more keys that were even farther away. The first tribe to have all of their players escape the cages and touch their tribe mat would win. Now we've seen versions of this challenge before, but the creative strategy involved part three, when the players had to fashion together the wobbly pole of bamboo. Each tribe was given twine to tie the pieces together, but the twine itself wasn't strong. You had to weigh how much twine you might need to make the pole less wobbly, but the more twine you use, the more time you used, and this was a race. Now I don't know the exact rules for this challenge, what is and isn't allowed. They usually don't tell us that anyway, because the outcasts go on to win which makes for exciting TV, but what you may have missed is how they won. When the outcasts first emerged from the jungle, they were wearing these purple rags to identify them as the new purple tribe. Every tribe on Survivor has a certain buff with a tribe color. They exist to help identify to the audience who is on which tribe. So the outcasts weren't really a conventional tribe. They didn't have their own buff because they were made up of voted out players from the other two tribes. So the producers gave them a name and a tribe color and gave them purple rags of sorts to help distinguish them from the orange and the blue tribe. But when the challenge happened, we saw 
Lil and Trish use some of their rags to assist in keeping their wobbly pole a little less so. The twine was vital, but the tribe buff of sorts made their pole even more sturdy. This little maneuver happens so quickly that it's barely noticeable, but the amount of support that these purple rags gave their pole was likely a game changer. As we saw in the challenge, the Drake tribe was initially ahead of the outcasts, but when their pole fell apart in the third cage, they had to go back to the drawing board and apply more twine. The outcasts never had to do that. They built their pole once, and that was enough. They took the lead and won the challenge. And while this is definitely a unique strategy with some quick thinking on the outcast part, I do wonder how fair it was given the other two tribes didn't have these rags. They did have buffs and clothing, and maybe they could have used those streamers around the cages to help out. Each of the tribes had rags hanging around their cages that likely could have been used if they were thinking quickly enough. But the outcasts didn't use those either, so I don't know. I also want to quickly say that I had the pleasure of interviewing one of the outcasts on a personal call with Trish about this challenge, and she told me the producers never told them that they could or couldn't use those rags. They just thought it up on the spot. Ryan is through. The outcasts defeat Morgan and Drake. This challenge is over. The second hack is similar to another strategy that I've talked about in Survivor All-Stars. Players had to run across balance beams in a race to retrieve small flags. One tribe recognized how good Boston Rob was at navigating the beams, so the strategy came down to throwing your spot in the queue so Rob could continuously be given a chance to run the course. Every player ahead of him on his tribe would just jump off and accelerate his spot in line so that he could run again. It's a really great strategy that gave them the win, and if we fast forward to season 33, Millennials vs. Generation X, we see it happen again. This challenge has three parts. Five players had to carry heavy sacks through an obstacle course and across a jagged balance beam. Once every sack was delivered, they could then be opened to reveal sandbags that would be used to knock down a puzzle. After every piece of the puzzle was knocked down, two more players would reassemble the puzzle to win the challenge. Any advantage to buy you time is gonna be worth its weight in bags of sand. And right away we see the Gen X tribe take the lead going up 2 to 1 in navigating the balance beam. But then CC on the Gen X tribe gets on the beam and everything slows to a halt. And this is where the strategy comes into play. Over on the Millennials tribe, Will beckons to Taylor, the guy who carried the first sack across, to come back and work on the next. Taylor was lightning fast, why not just have him do it again? So Figgy then makes her way across and ties up the game 2-2, two to two, and then Taylor takes bag number 3 and just zips across. And then Michaela grabs the fourth Millennial sack and manages to score one more time, all while Cece is still slowly making her way across the beam. Legend has it, she still might be out there to this day. The Millennial tribe went from being down two to one to now being up four to two and Taylor then takes the fifth and final sack across to move on to the next part. Taylor carries three of the sacks for his team and increases their lead which allows the rest of the tribe to assemble the puzzle ahead of the Gen Xers. Is Taylor the millennial version of Boston Rob? Makes you think. Yes! 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 Do they have it? Come on! Yes! Yes! Millennials win! Immunity! Yes! Continuing our conversation about Boston Rob, what is this, the Jeff Probst Tower? The third hack goes back to the attack zone I mentioned from Survivor All-Stars. Well, as many of you know, the attack zone originated three seasons prior in season five, Thailand, and was held over water, but the challenge itself was mostly the same. I've talked about this version of the challenge a lot as of late, how Sukjai broke a ton of rules and reduced their tribe to just Xi'an by the end of it, how they were in the lead for most of it, yet still managed to lose anyway. Did their crushing defeat all happen because they continuously broke the rules? Turns out, maybe. But the Chewigon tribe was also using a great strategy to maintain their pace, especially once they began to gain momentum. Unfortunately, while I don't think the attack zone is ever likely to return to our screens, I want to give a shout out to this fantastic defensive strategy used by Ted to prevent the opposition from making much ground. To provide some context, the challenge had players running across the beams to collect some items. If two players from opposing tribes met in the middle, they would square off in the attack zone where they would, you know, attack each other. If either player fell in the water, they would have to go back to the start, forfeiting the item they were holding. The first tribe to 10 points wins, and the purple Sukjai tribe took a commanding 8-4 lead. It was becoming a fast blowout, and Chewigon had to do something to prevent them from getting those final two points. Now, yes, this challenge is most infamous because Sukjai began to implode once they had this massive lead. They accidentally kept breaking the cardinal rule, you gotta have at least one foot in the attack zone when you first make 
initiate contact. We see Ken, Rob, Stephanie, Jed, and even Penny all break the rules, which costs them a point. That said, while it was still eight to four, Ted, the biggest guy on Chewigon, made his way across the beams and pulled off a great maneuver. He turned around. He didn't go to the other end and grab an item, which is what you were supposed to be doing. Instead, he kept his hands free and just played defense. Ted had already held his own against Rob earlier in the challenge, and now he was becoming a shield, preventing the other Sukjai from scoring. They had to get past him if they wanted to win. He is a wall that cannot be passed. If you pay close attention, you might notice that Penny can be seen watching Ted back up, and then Clay gets back to the middle with an item, and Penny is still just standing there totally defeated. Ted lets Clay pass, Penny then cheats in typical Sukjai fashion, but it doesn't matter. Ted's defense saved the day and kept Sukjai from staging a comeback after blowing a lead. Chewigon wins reward! The fourth creative strategy comes from season nine, Vanuatu, in episode eight, where the two tribes compete for a reward challenge right before the merge. This is a fairly common challenge in Survivor, where the players have to gather water from the ocean into a bucket and then dump the bucket into a bigger bucket. Once the bigger bucket is full enough, it'll lower, raising a flag. The first tribe to raise their flag or light the torch or whatever wins. The tricky part is that the person who fills up the first small bucket has to then toss it to a second tribe mate who then tosses it to a third and then a fourth and so on. So with every toss, the bucket loses water. A bad toss could ruin the entire chain and waste time. By the time the bucket gets to the final tribe mate, there may be no water left. In some seasons, they just had to toss water from person to person instead of the bucket itself, but in Vanuatu, they had a hybrid. The bucket was tossed up until the final throw, at which point only water was thrown. And boy, did the player who was on the end get a whole lot of water thrown on them. For most of this challenge, the two tribes were equal, until Rory realized he was totally drenched and basically standing in water. So what did he do? He took off his shoes and he emptied them into the bucket. That is a fair bit of water that he had in there. Likewise, throughout the challenge, he was also using his buff to both collect water and then squeegee it into his bucket. Of course, like all good strategies, his opponent noticed what was happening and then copied him. And despite Rory having a leg up with his shoes, it was Chris who prevailed in the end. Yeah! And it is! <laughs> But of course this challenge has been run so many times, so I looked at future versions of this challenge to see if it had ever happened again, and given Rory is such a game changer, I wasn't surprised to see it had. In season 13, Cook Islands, we saw Penner's wife Stacy use her shirt, at which point Ozzy's mom then copies her. In season 20, Heroes vs. Villains, we saw Russell's wife use her hair and even spit, interesting strat, as well as Rupert's wife Laura use her hair and shirt. On season 28, Kagian, Chaos Cast, well, before she became Chaos Cast, also also uses her shirt after Jatia gives her nothing, which uh, may have been enough because the brains actually won this challenge. Either way, it has been a repeated strategy for years and kind of like Pearl Islands, if you can use your buff or your clothes or anything around you to get ahead, do it. Tomorrow you make your apologies. Today, you spit in your bucket. Yes, exactly. <laughs> The fifth and final strategy is sticking with the pre-HD era for a challenge that's only ever happened twice, with only one player in the history of Survivor who has ever competed in it both times. I am talking about a challenge from both Season 6, The Amazon, and Season 8, All Stars. This was a challenge called Matchmaker, where the players were given a box with items in them. They had to ask another player from the other tribe if they had one of their items, they had to match each of the items in their box with another item from someone else's. It's basically the card game go fish, but with like, you know, rocks and driftwood and seashells. Whichever tribe had the most pairings after all items were paired up was the winner. We saw the challenge first happen in the Amazon, but the editors kind of like fast forwarded through it, so it was difficult to keep track of every item and who was doing what. But in the second iteration, All Stars, a man who was at one point considered the greatest to never win Survivor by Jeff Probst, and may still hold that title depending on who you ask, Rob Sesternino pulled out a strategy that guaranteed his tribe, Shapera, 
would win this reward challenge. Rob metagamed the producers after seeing this challenge go down on his first season in season six, and so he knew they would be lazy and repeat their challenge setup. Rob told his tribe that all you have to do is ask the person to your left for any of the four items that you have. More than likely, that person would have what you're asking them for. So if Boston Rob asked Richard for a rock, Richard is likely going to have a rock, and so on. Rob did say this strategy isn't 100% guaranteed, which to be fair it isn't, but it most likely would work out because he knew the producers had to have a setup that was simple for them to follow and would ensure each of the three tribes had even even pairings across the board. For example, if you pause and look at what all these players had, Boston Rob had a rock, driftwood, sponge, and a shell. Richard, standing on Rob's left, had a rock, driftwood, sponge, and a coconut. Boston Rob had a 75% chance of getting it right, so long as he asked Richard. Maybe the stats people out there could crunch the numbers, but as we see in the episode, Rob Sestronino's strategy proved to work, for the most part, for Shapera, even after Boston Rob ignored Rob C's strategy in the first round. <sighs> They never listen. The rest of Shapera continuously asked the people to their left for items, and in the end, Shapera won the challenge, all thanks to the man who knew it all. Boston when Rob, he, 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 at first he starts asking other people, but then he gets with the program. He, he, I think he just doesn't want to listen to you at first, make it look like it was well, his own idea. And I tell these guys, ask the person on your left for the same wow. thing. Because for the most part, the most of the boxes are the same as the ones next to it. When they put the challenge together, it's easier to remember when they're putting right. it together what is next what to each other. What? So for the most part, most of the boxes are s similar to the ones next to each other. The mastermind, now you know why we say you're the smartest person not to win Survivor. Yeah. All right, Sester Nino. Lex, do you have any coral? Oh, unbelievable. How are you guys doing this? From season 14, Survivor Fiji. Let's talk about the final seven immunity challenge where the challenge was broken into two parts. The first involved the players digging in a sandy lane for three objects. The second part involved the players using their three objects or their three steps to climb a pole to grab a flag. The first part tested how fast and thorough players could dig. As we saw Yao Man using a peculiar technique to cover his entire lane and then dig deep in one swoop. Yao Man was testing how deep the steps were buried, so he didn't waste time in one spot for too long. Conversely, Cassandra treated it like it was kitty litter. Yao Man also did one of my favorite maneuvers where he began to shovel his sand into Alex's lane because Alex was on the bottom and Yao didn't want Alex to win. The second part of the challenge had three players take their steps, lock them into an allocated fixture, and then climb to the top one step at a time. We can see the dream team intended for this to be done roughly one step at a time, Alex just leaps his way up the pole and discards the whole, you know, putting a step in place to climb higher. Like climbing a palm tree really, really fast, Alex gets to the top in no time ahead of the rest. But he doesn't find his footing when he gets there and struggles to grab his flag. Boo and Dreams also copy him after they see how successful he was, although Boo does use a step at the end to brace himself. I always love it when players discard challenge items just to blitz to the finish line. Alex! Scaling to the top! Can he pull it off? But taking it back to Yao Man, in episode eight of the same season, we saw him compete in a tribal immunity challenge broken up into three parts. The first was a blow dart competition, the second was spear throwing, and the third was archery. Blow darts was worth one point, spears two, and archery three. The blow dart part proved to be the easiest as barely anyone missed. The spear part was a lot trickier, however, as almost nobody could land a spear. For the entire challenge, only Dreams landed a spear on the outer rim him and then came Yao Man. Yao changed it up, whereas everyone was just landing short, Yao decided to back up and make a run with the spear, as you often see when people effectively throw spears. Yao ran to gain momentum so his spear would travel straight, unlike everyone else whose spear just flopped forward. Yao nailed the target almost in the middle and won his tribe the two points. The third part was archery, and again, barely anyone could land an arrow. Michelle hit the outer rim, Dreams just barely hit the yellow, but then once again, Yao Man showed up to show these rookies how it's done. Well, 
sorta. Yao did two things to help himself land the shot. The first was to look for the straightest arrow of the bunch. Not a big difference, but it couldn't hurt. The second was to kneel when he took aim. Kneeling often helps maintain balance and increase accuracy, especially if you don't have much practice with shooting a bow. And Yao took advantage of that. He nailed the shot, almost hitting the red and guaranteeing his try one immunity. What kind of move will he have with a bow and arrow? Yeah, man, what are you possibly looking for? Straightest possible arrow. The third creative strategy comes from Dean in the finale episode of season 39, Island of the Idols. In the first immunity challenge of the finale, we saw a table maze pop up at the end of the multi-part course. The first player to land a ball in each of the two holes wins. One hole was halfway up the maze, the second was at the end. We have seen table mazes used a lot in Survivor, but they mostly only feature either one hole or a pattern where the holes are side by side. This one on season 39 has had two and they were separated and there was no rule on the order. I've talked about this maneuver before for other challenges where you start at the back and you work your way to the front, which can make the challenge easier as you get more practice. You have to sink both anyway, start with the furthest and move forward. Dean was the only player to do just that and he won. Dean lands his first, but he lands the deepest one, which is more difficult. Dean has one more ball to drop and it's the close one and he's quickly getting there. But to make it even more interesting, what caught my attention is that we saw this exact maze reappear in season 42, three seasons later, and Jeff now specified in the rules that the players had to sink the closer hole first, likely meaning they did not want players to replicate Dean's strategy. Everybody dead even right now, you've got to land the first ball, the closest ball first. The fourth hack is from Survivor 43 in the premiere episode. And I think many of you know what I'm going to talk about. In the very first challenge of the season, we saw players have to compete in a multi-part course involving lifting heavy boxes, swimming to get a boat, putting together a puzzle, and then retrieving their flint. The flint was attached to a ring dangling in the air and players could use giant bamboo to help nudge it off. The problem was the pole the key was on was at an angle which made lifting the key ring off difficult. The ring would slide back down unless a player was able to perfectly keep the bamboo pressed against the ring. This was proving difficult as the Blue Coco tribe got to this part first but couldn't capitalize on their lead. Cody on the Red Vessi tribe thought up a brilliant solution. Instead of focusing on the ring, they should focus on the flint. Cody told Dwight to put the flint inside the bamboo to keep it steady. This little maneuver made dragging the ring off incredibly easy and won the challenge for the Vessi tribe. But we're not stopping there. The fifth creative strategy is also from the same season and in the same episode, but it's from the blue tribe. After Vessi won the reward challenge, the punishment for the blue and yellow tribes was to compete in a task called Sweat or Savvy. They could pick between doing a physical task or a mental one. And while we saw Sammy on the yellow Baka tribe intelligently discover the answer to the bone puzzle, the creative strategy strategy comes from Ryan on the Blue Coco tribe who had to dig in a large area for the pot and machete. Ryan was given four hours to find the bundled items and he was partnered with Gio who was unsure where to start. The players began digging but quickly became tired but then Ryan realized there was a better strategy. Instead of digging in random places, they should dig in an X pattern. This strategy, this X pattern, allows them to tactically cover all four quadrants of the square instead of investing investing one hour into each quadrant and hoping they get lucky. And the strategy proved incredibly effective as Ryan found the items in less than 30 minutes. But we're still not stopping just yet. Even though I said five moments would be included, let's add one more. From Survivor, 43. From the same episode as the previous two. I think this is a record. In the immunity challenge, players had to run through an obstacle course that ended in a table maze. Each tribe had a different maze, but the first tribe to sink all three balls would win or get second, assuming they were the second tribe to finish. While the blue tribe's maze was fairly basic and just took time, and the yellow's was... Well, it was a modified version of Dean's from Island of the Idols. The Red Tribe had less of a maze and more of a straight shot. It was a single lane with tiny bumpers. The Red Tribe struggled to figure out how to make this work. Even with the bumpers, it was difficult. Because two players were holding the handle, navigating a tight beam was tricky. But they managed to find momentum after they stopped working side by side and instead stood one in front of the other. Jesse positioned himself behind Noel and this allowed them to focus the 
their hands on the same spot doing the same thing at the same time. They only did this for the first ball though, as I have heard this technique was not allowed, the producers made them separate, but then we did see Jesse in future attempts place his hand under the table to help stabilize it. Also not sure if that was allowed, if Jeff even caught it, but either way, if Jeff is telling you to stop, you're probably doing something right. And that's it. That's 10 videos in one. And to be honest, there very well could be an 11th video out there one day, but not today. Today we feasted. If you did watch this entire video and didn't just skip ahead to hear if I recorded new audio for the outro, that's a lot of Survivor. I hope you were entertained. And after all of this, please remember to go to the bathroom and also hydrate. A huge thank you to my patrons for all your support through each month and year and challenge hack video. It's been a long road to get here. It feels like we're at some kind of peak, but regardless of what's next, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Seriously, don't forget to drain your bowels on your way out. And I will see you in the next one once i find a way to anti-hack the youtube algorithm do you want me to take the gamble of running across with one of these really quick no no let's all do it blue is going for broke everybody gonna get on barrels and try to roll their way to the end it's an incredible strategy if it works go sierra Shereen falls the fight is off everybody's got to go back she's got these big old boobs i can't get past <laughs> Get, make a move. The women making no progress. Hold me, like, hold me. Cat oh may not be the best the person back. to have put on the end. And with that, Christina's in the water. I don't think you have to Kat go just back. jumps back in. Not sure why. Kat. Two hands. Cat reached out and grabbed him. Once again, Cat jumped in for no reason. It's definitely the boobs are hard. Hands on the floor, hands on the floor. Forward, forward, by your knee, by your knee. Okay, go forward, 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 go forward. Forward, 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 forward. Oh, I got it. There you go, that's it. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah, Bill, keep going. You don't have to hit it that hard. Just hit a little. There you go. Moto has one bundle left. Faster, yeah, Lynn, faster, faster. Follow the rail, follow the rail. You're doing awesome. Follow the rail. Moto. Oh. Lisi's so excited, she takes a face plant. I have a really good sense of balance. Okay, then you balance. So you go plate, okay. your bow, your digging. Okay, She's bow, comfortable plate. with. Yeah. Okay, got it. Up it is now ball, Debbie ball. on the course for up Mana ball, with the ball. handle. Debbie had the lead for Mana, but she has lost it. Debbie continues to struggle. Go. Debbie drops, she's gotta go back. Oh, Debbie. No, Debbie's gotta go back. Mana was in the lead, but they are dead last now as Debbie drops again. She has lost a lot of time. Debbie continues to try to get through this obstacle for Mana. Debbie fails again. She was adamant about doing it, wasn't she? I know. Yeah. Nuka wins oh, reward. Job, Mana comes up empty-handed. Yes, you finished it. Once again, we lost, and we don't strategize. It's a dictatorship with Brad just telling people what positions they're going to take. I have a really good sense of balance. Okay, then you balance. Here's what it comes down to. It's a total lack of respect for me. If Haley wants to do the balance beam, even though she cost us peanut butter and jelly by dicking around for 10 freaking minutes, and I zipped across a balance beam in 30 seconds, that means you don't respect me. It's freaking nauseating, frustrating, and I'm pissed! Watching Debbie get upset like that, I got really scared. I think Debbie's just different. She's like a crazy lady. She's good in a balance beam. She caused us peanut butter and jelly. Debbie thinks she's an expert in everything, but Haley is better than her. Why don't you just shut the up and not talk? I get it. It's cool. I'm good. One more twist at the auction. Abby bought an advantage in this game. It's a note. Want to read it? Move directly to the final round in this challenge. You have a one in three shot at winning immunity. She can't win this. She can't climb. But watch how good her knee is. Here we go. We have Abby, who bought her way into the final round. Survivor's ready. Go. Abby's through first, then Carter. Abby is whipping through these knots, pulling away from Carter. Oh, my God. Abby continues to fly through this course. Abby now at the last gate of rope. 
She gets through these knots. Abby will win immunity and be safe at Tribal Council. <laughs> Abby slides down. Abby yeah. wins immunity. Yeah. Is safe at tonight's Tribal Council and guaranteed a one in six shot at winning this game. Oh, oh, God. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, are you okay? I wish I would be voting off Mike today. Mike is really annoying. Big scramble for the ball. Coach now has it for the Villains. Coach now with a free shot. Not even close. Crystal, yes. you are off the course. Oh, you are in the wrong lane. You're completely off track. Crystal, up over a hitching post, heading the right way. In the wrong lane. Crystal once again off the course. Crystal back on the course. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bob took a header into his station. Susie is off the course. And he takes a header into a pole. Crystal not giving up, continues to fight in this challenge. Susie trying to find the course. That is what research and practice gets you. Listen to you future Survivor players. That's how you do it right there. Feet right. can't touch. No. Great. Tiffany, we're so low. Let's go, Tiffany. No, Debbie's got to go back. In the in the hope. In the lead, but they are dead last now as Debbie drops again. She has lost a lot of time. Nuka wins reward. Good job, baby. Mana comes up empty handed. Yes, you've finished it. I'm sick of losing, guys. Me too. Tell me what to do, Reed. Try it up a little bit. There you go. Try that. Colby falls short. Sweet. You're doing good. Reed, I'm throwing it farther. Oh, okay. okay. Come on. We'll smooth it. Reed, talk to me for God's sake. Keep it straight. Uh, Reed. I did. I held it right there. Throw it smooth. He's been that way 34 days, Reed. Reed, tell me what you want. Just throw it. Just throw it high. Uh. Come on, Reed. Get it. Come on, Reed. That is the fastest anybody's ever gotten Go. under a log. Go. Go. Here comes Debbie for the brain drive, like a turtle birthing an egg. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? Maybe the singular best moment that represents Survivor is Suri, and she go, got girl. across. Yeah, and it was this incredible yeah. moment. 